I open this meeting of the Committee of the Whole Parliament to consider Stage 2 of the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Bill. For the duration of these proceedings, I am the convener of the committee. In dealing with amendments, members should have the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons or press R as soon as possible after I call the group. A member should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. Convener. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. I wonder if I could seek your guidance, um, Convener. I lodged amendments around section 2 of this bill, and the uh, Parliament officials have uh, not been said they were not allowed to submit them. Is it the policy of the Parliament that certain amendments are not acceptable, which take out certain parts of the bill once it has been passed at stage one, which means whatever this Parliament believes of a certain section of the bill, it will always remain, even if we vote against it? Um, I thank Mr Balfour for his point of order. Rule 9.10.5c 9 states that an, an amendment is not admissible if it is inconsistent with the general principles of the Bill as agreed by the Parliament, that is, if the amendment would reverse, um, substantially alter or render ineffective a principal purpose of the Bill. Uh, where a bill is introduced with only one or two principal purposes, an amendment to leave out or substantially alter that purpose or one of those purposes would not normally be admissible. So I go back to... And that is, how would then the Parliament remove sections of the bill? But you can't. It's not in committee. Um, for clarity, Mr Balfour, you can put an amendment in to remove a section unless it would be a wrecking amendment. Now we move on to operation of the rent cap and I call amendment one in the name of Jel Jeremy Balfour, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Yes, that's I point out that if amendment 21 in the group entitled application of the rent cap is agreed to, then I cannot call amendments 22 and 27 due to preemption. So Jeremy Balfour to move amendment one and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Karina, and I would like to move amendment one and amendment 32, um, which are both in my name. We had a, a very helpful debate, I think, yesterday afternoon at stage one. And there was lots of evidence given in that debate that the way to control the rights of tenants is not necessarily to control the rents that landlords can charge. We all understand that we are in a situation where there is financial hardship facing many people here in Scotland. Both landlords and tenants are facing difficult times. But the methodology of simply saying we're going to freeze all rents and have a control section, as this bill does, will actually, in my view, and I think in the opinion of most housing associations and experts on this, cause greater damage rather than less, than in less benefit. During the speeches, my colleagues Murdo Fraser and Stephen Kerr gave examples of what's happened in other countries, whether that is Dublin, in, uh, in Berlin and in Stockholm. We have seen the situation in those three countries see more people becoming homeless, less housing available, and the situation grow worse. That is why this amendment, and Amendment 32, goes to the heart of what this Parliament should be trying to do. We agree action needs to be taken and we are disappointed that the Scottish Government have taken so long to do anything. 
But surely to do the wrong thing is not the answer. And in fact, the two, the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary, just a few months ago, were arguing exactly what I am arguing today. And what they were saying is that this is not the way forward. We need action from government. And my fear is... Uh, John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I, I mean, would you accept that this is a temporary a freeze or rent cap that is only up to the end of March? That does not affect housing associations, but I accept they are interested after April. Jeremy uh, Well, firstly, um, the point I was making was that ministers and cabinet secretaries, the government, have changed their mind. Yep. And if this bill goes through unamended uh, today and tomorrow, 18 months, yep. it seems to me not a long time. Now, I know... The SNP likes to talk about generations being a few weeks, <laughs> but for most of us, 18 months is a long period of time. Yep. And what this will do, in my opinion, and in the opinion of housing associations and of the experts, if you've been listening to them in the emails that you have received, it will force people to give up their properties yep. and we will see more people homeless across our country. And that's why I'm asking members to support the two amendments in my name. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 2 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Kimira, if I could just start with um, Jeremy Balfour's Amendment number 1. I do agree with Jeremy Balfour's comments that the Government have changed their mind on this. We welcome that change of mind. We called for that in the, the, the summer, so we are absolutely delighted to see the Government following where Labour have led and so would oppose um, Mr Balfour's um, amendment number one. The rest of the amendments in this group, um, all amendments apart from one and 32 in my name, are my attempt to be helpful to the Government and in particular to be helpful to the First Minister. The, the First Minister in her programme for Government in early September in that statement said that rents would be frozen from that day. Now, this bill does not propose to freeze rents from that day. Rents can increase today, they can increase tomorrow, they can increase the day after that, and for weeks and weeks and weeks, up until the 5th of December, for those tenants who live in the private sector. So, like I say, these amendments are an attempt to be helpful for the First, uh, for the first Minister, to make sure that the statement the First Minister made in Parliament can remain accurate, and that is to change the dates in the bill to, um, from the 6th of September to the 6th of June. That means that any notice um, issued by a private landlord that has the three months to take effect um, will be ruled ineligible after the 6th of June. That means that the First Minister's statement that all rents were frozen on the day she made her programme for government um, statement can remain valid. And so, on that basis, I ask members to support Amendments 2, 3, 7, 14, 15, 17, 22 and 27. Thank you, Kimura. Thank you. I call Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, briefly, at the outset, can I once again thank colleagues from across political parties, stakeholders and, most particularly, officials from both Government and Parliament for the incredible pace at which they have worked uh, in, in bringing us to this point. Uh, amendments 1 and 32, uh, as Jeremy Balfour says, are very clearly intended to uh, take away one of the, the principal functions of this bill. He says that we had a powerful debate at stage one. Yes, indeed we did, and Parliament agreed to the general principles of the bill. Uh, and even if these amendments are admissible, it seems to me that at a political level they do fundamentally undermine the purpose of the bill itself. The Conservatives, of course, have a perfect right to disagree, uh, but there is no ambiguity about these amendments. Uh, they are fundamentally opposed to the reasons why we are bringing this bill in the context of a cost of living crisis. We believe that an emergency response is necessary and tenants are particularly exposed to that cost of living crisis. That justifies a rent freeze. I would just add finally that we did not, uh, <laughs> absolutely did not, as Mr Balfour suggests, uh, argue the case that he is arguing a few months ago. What we did then was to oppose an amendment which we were convinced would not be legally competent 
this presiding officer is legally competent, will be effective uh, at giving protection to tenants. Uh, in respect to the, the remaining amendments in this group, uh, these would, as Mr Griffin says, have the effect of uh, retrospectively applying the rent control measures contained in Section 1 to the 6th of June rather than the 6th of September. The purpose of backdating these measures to the 6th of September, as I think the First Minister ha herself has made clear, is to avoid that programme for government announcement resulting in landlords uh, seeking to uh, avoid the effect of the measures by acting before we have time uh, to bring the, the law before Parliament. In effect, to avoid uh, rent increase notices being issued in response to the announcement. Uh, ensuring uh, that this protection is given is accomplished by the Bill. It is a necessary part of the package delivering protections for tenants, uh, and uh, I think it gives a, a level of clarity both to both landlords and tenants. I am afraid I cannot accept the amendment to backdate this to June. We believe that would run contrary to the, lead, the need for the law to be fair and certain. Uh, it would uh, result in um, landlords uh, e effectively uh, uh, change the, the effect of them having been unaware of the intention to change the law months before uh, that programme for government announcement was made. And to do so would uh, inevitably uh, open up the legislation to challenge and cause a significant degree of uncertainty. I give way. Mark Griffin. I think the uncertainty was caused by the First Minister announcing at her statement for programme for government that rents would be frozen from that day. That has created uncertainty for tenants who would rightly have an expectation that their rents would be frozen from the time the First Minister made that announcement, not well into December. If the Minister is not going to accept these amendments, does he accept that the First Minister should change the record? Minister. Thank you. I, I, I do think the First Minister has been clear. I, I regret the fact that the, the member is choosing to, to misinterpret in that way. Uh, it is very clear that the intention is to prevent uh, rent increase notices as a response to the programme for government announcement, uh, and that is achieved by the Bill as it stands. Uh, so, uh, while I thank the members for their contribution to the debate on this group, I must ask Parliament to vote against all amendments in this group. Thank you. And Jeremy Balfour to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 1. Uh, nothing else further to add, Commissioner. I'm happy to move. Can I confirm that you are pressing Amendment 1, Mr Balfour? I'm Commissioner. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, the Parliament is not agreed, therefore, well, the Committee of the Parliament is not agreed, therefore, there will be a division. And as this is the first division of the, the stage, I will suspend for around five minutes to allow members to access the digital voting system.
We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 1. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Shona Robinson. Just check that my vote was recorded. I can confirm that your vote was recorded. Oh, Stephanie Callahan does need a point of order. Point of order, Stephanie Callahan. Sir, I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Mary Goujon. I, my page wouldn't load, and I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number one in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes, 27, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The, the committee is not agreed. Therefore, we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 20, no, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment three in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment one. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Move on to the group entitled application of the rent cap. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with Amendments 
as shown in the groupings. And can I point out that if Amendment 21 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 22 and 27 in the group entitled Operations of the Rent Cap and Amendments 23, 24, 25 and 26 in this group due to preemption. So, Miles Briggs to move Amendment 4 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. And can I start with Amendment 4 in my name, which looks to remove the social rented sector uh, from this bill and exempt it from regulations. We believe that the social housing sector should be exempt from uh, the bill and that the sector is already highly regulated and has taken important steps in keeping increased rents as low as possible. Furthermore, the Scottish, housing of, uh, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations have warned that unintended consequences of this bill with regards to social housing, the development of affordable housing, and also potential costs around construction costs, which we've seen increase, net zero targets not being met. And so we would therefore ask members to support my amendment four and also Willie Rennie's amendment five. Amendment 23 in my name um, looks towards properties in the mid-market rates. Mid-market rates is an affordable housing tenure offered by housing associations. The homes for rent to households on low to middle incomes. Rent for MMR homes are generally set lower than private rents, but higher than housing, associ housing association rents for social housing. It's an important part of the housing mix to support those who may not be eligible or cannot access social rented homes but struggle to afford higher rents in the private sector. The issue here is the Tennessee type is a private uh, residency, the, the same as homes rented by private landlords. We therefore hope that members will support Amendment 23. My Amendment 26 um, is with regards to rent increase notices to be sent out to tenants before the um, expiry of this legislation. The bill states that any rent increase notice served while the rent cap is in force will have no effect, which effectively means that no rent rise notice can be served upon any tenant prior to the 1st of April 2023, assuming rent freeze expires on the day before. In effect, this would mean that rent freezes will remain in place until the end of April, not the end of uh, March, as ministers have outlined, given the requirement to give 28 days notice of any rent, ch rent change uh, in the social sector. We therefore believe that landlords should be able to provide this notice before the 1st of April. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie to speak to Amendment 5 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I um, will speak to Amendments 5, 21 and 25. My amendments are focused on the social sector, but also the mid-market rental properties in the charity sector. Um, in short, I want to remove them from the provisions of the bill. My rationale is that it won't help. The majority of tenants in the social sector won't benefit from the cap as their rent is paid by universal credit. There are targeted funds to help those struggling for those who are finding it difficult to pay their rent. And rents in the social sector are about half of those in the private sector. So the cap won't really help people with the cost of living, but the damage could be significant. It's the uncertainty that's most damaging. Although the rent cap may never have an effect on rents in the social sector, the uncertainty that it might has a massive impact on planning for the future. That means a cut to the house building and maintenance programmes. Even though they support the universal cap, there are several charities and organisations that have lobbied today have highlighted this particular issue. Now, the Minister recognises that there is a problem. To his credit, he's been working hard to reassure the sector. He has been committed to partnership working with them. He's indicated that the social and private sector may be decoupled post-March. But I would suggest it would be much easier to decouple the sector now by removing them from the scope of the bill. Tenants would continue to be protected by the sector the uncertainty would be removed, planning could restart, new houses previously in doubt could go ahead, existing homes could have new bathrooms, kitchens, windows and roofs. Now, we heard yesterday very wise contributions from Bob Doris and John Mason. They relayed the concerns of the housing associations. Whilst I'm willing to... Uh, yes, certainly. Bob Doris. Uh, thank Mr Rainey for giving way. Whilst I, I'm not going to support 
his amendments today. I wonder if Mr Rennie would agree that the statutory rent consultation process all housing associations have to conduct would be a really useful tool in deciding whether these powers were ever used from April next year onwards. And I would just state again, presiding officer, that of course it's a cap, not a freeze in principle. So they could in theory be used sparingly, but my preference would be that they're not used at all. But do you agree that the rent consultation process could inform whether they are indeed ever used? Willie Rennie. And I think that's right, and that's one of the benefits of the, the social sector, is that we've had those in place for many, many years, and that's resulted in very low rents, half of those in the private sector. And my argument would be we should use those processes now, not just post-March. But I do accept the point that Bob Doris has made. It may be a mechanism for going forward. Um, I think they should be treated differently. Let's not fix what isn't broken. So my three amendments have three purposes. Amendment 21 removes social housing from the scope of the bill. Amendment 25 gives a longer notice period on rent cap changes to allow the sector to consult and prepare for any changes. I also support Miles Briggs' Amendment 4. Turning to Amendment 23, it's about mid-market rents. Um, I support removing those from the scope of the bill for those in the charity sector. There are many organisations like the Gannachy Trust in Perth that provide excellent housing that are of high standard. In fact, I saw very new ones recently um, which are of very high energy efficiency, and their rents are mid-market. I think those rents are effectively controlled just now, so we're trying to control what's already controlled. Their planning could be interrupted for the future, and I would suggest in the same way as trying to remove uh, social housing from the scope of this bill, we should also remove mid-market rents in the charity sector from the scope of this bill. So I would urge members to support four or five 21, 23 and 25. Thank you. Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 6 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. My first set of amendments, Amendment 6, 16 and 24, address the question that landlords cannot raise rents between tenancies. These amendments seek to prevent a landlord from raising the rent of a property between tenancies up to the 31st of March. 2023. This applies to private rented sector, short assured tenancies and Scottish secure tenancies. There are a couple of issues that I had in my fair rents bill in the last parliament I would like to test in relation to this legislation, and this is one of them. I have a concern that unless this is done, we may see a surge in either illegal convictions or uh, illegal increases of rent. There's something the third sector organisations have raised in their briefings. Um, to MSPs this week. Citizens of Divide Scotland, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Poverty Alliance and Shelter Scotland are concerned about unintended consequences for tenants and landlords with low public awareness. They are concerned that it runs the risk of an increased number of evictions and unlawful rent increases with unclear options of redress. I would ask ministers to consider the response to this. That In the frame of the legislation, it is clear uh, how it would operate um, if landlords uh, operate within the law, what we do know there is a small minority who may not operate within the law. And, of course, between tenancies means that the tenant has already been evicted and the landlord can impose a new rent, which is not a rent freeze. And the joint briefing from these organisations uh, expresses quite sincere uh, and widespread concerns about illegal um, Eviction, so I'd ask ministers to address that. My other amendments, number nine and number ten, relate to the statement that landlords will make in relation to their application to increase the rent in the framework of the bill. So these amendments seek to make sure that landlords cannot insist that the proposed, in the in proposed increases are done until after the rent officer or the first deal tribunal has approved this. Further to this, the landlord should make it clear in their communication to the tenant that the new, te the new rent will not be payable until this has been uh, approved. Uh, the reason I wanted to explore this is that uh, Richard Lennon made this point yesterday in the stage one debate, as did others. Um, you know, I do not believe we have the right balance between landlords and tenants in the legislative framework beyond this. And therefore, I think where possible, we must seek to balance what might be fearful tenants 
who think that because the landlord has applied, therefore it's automatically it will be approved. And I'd like landlords to explain to their tenants that they're applying for it. I want it to be included in the statement uh, because, of course, um, the, the tribunal may not be satisfied that the hardship test is, um, is there. Uh, just lastly, I didn't want to really comment much on the other amendments from Willie Rennie and uh, Mills Briggs. It was just one point to Willie Rennie I wanted to make. Oh, sure, yeah. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, and uh, convener, I'd just like to make it clear that I recorded a register of interest yesterday that I have rental ra private rental housing. The problem is with first tier uh, um, arbitration when it comes down to it. I'm currently told the wait time is eight to nine months, um, and there is no well, there is provision within the financial uh, uh, memorandum with this bill saying that it, there's sufficient funds there. There obviously isn't. I, I wonder if the members re would reflect on whether the first-tier first tribunals, in order to comply with her wish, should have more money so they could sit more regularly and give satisfactory answers quickly to tenants. Paulie McNeill. Uh, it's difficult to disagree with the member because uh, in anything I've ever said in this parliament, I, I have always tried to strike the right balance between landlords and tenants, and I don't think it helps anyone to have an inefficient tribunal system. So, yes, I don't have any difficulty agreeing with that. But what I'm trying to achieve with my amendments is that I don't want uh, tenants thinking um, that because a landlord has applied, notwithstanding the point the member makes, that it can take some time. And that is not fair to the landlord. I totally accept that. But it isn't fair to the tenant either. And that's what I seek to do in these amendments. I just wanted to make one point to Willie Rennie about the question of universal credit. I think it's quite important to understand that in the housing support sector, um, those who are not on universal credit but are on low pay who do not get support from the government, it's incredibly hard to access hardship funds. And I've argued this many, many times. So please I ask members not to discount those poor families, particularly in the private rented sector, which is where poverty mainly lies for families and children, to make sure that we are doing more to ensure that they have the support they need um, to support their tenancies and been able to, and have spoken long enough to allow the member to intervene. Yes. Willie Rennie. I have, no, I have no great disagreement about the poverty, particularly those in private rented tenancies. My my simple point about support mechanisms is through housing associations eh, with hardship grants that are available, perhaps not as much as we would like, but they are available and will help those who are struggling to pay their rent on top of those who receive eh, the universal credit. That's my central point, and I think that outweighs um, the disadvantages that will be received if we have a, eh, an inclusion of the social rented sector in the scope of this bill. Polly McNeill. I thank the member for the intervention who makes this point very well, but I hope that the point I'm making is not overlooked and it is this. If you operate support based on hardship funds, by and large, many people will not meet the test. It's not universal. And where we we were in the middle of an acute, the most acute crisis uh, in the cost of living, I simply think it's something to address further down the line that those who don't have government support need to have better ways to support their tenancies. It's just a wider point I wanted to make. And thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Alex Rowley to speak to Amendment 31 and other amendments in the group. Presiding Officer, thank you. I'm pleased to raise this Amendment 31 in my name as I feel there is a missed opportunity within this bill to extend the proposed protections to a group that have been overlooked within the legislation. Care home residents are, in effect, tenants in the same manner that students are, yet we see one group offer protection from the bill and one sidelined. Some care home charges fall under common law tenancies in a similar manner to student residential tenancies, for example, accommodation, utilities, food and insurance. As such, my amendment mirrors the wording of the existing provisions relating to student residential tenancies in the Bill to apply to eligible care home charges. 
Great effort has been put into the bill to ensure that students are included, despite more complex arrangements potentially being in place. Yet that same concern has not been shown to care home residents. The Parliament Bills team, when looking at this, have advised that the independently funded supported person contracts could be considered equivalent to student accommodation and therefore within the scope of this bill. I remember when Mercedes Villalba brought her amendment to the freeze rents to the COVID bill and the Deputy First Minister responded at that time by saying what was wrong with the amendments, where the weaknesses were. And I intervened and asked him the question, but what are you going to do about the excessive rent rises being highlighted by Mercedes Villalba? And I bring this amendment here today to try and raise those same types of issues, mm -hmm. the excessive costs yeah. that, that, that people who are having to pay their own fees are filing being piled upon them. So today I am highlighting the plight of self-funders in care homes and their families who say to me they are being fleeced and no one seems to care. I'm hearing from care home residents who are currently facing month on month increases in charges that they are paying. While safeguards are in place for many tenancies to stop rent increases from taking place more than once a year, that same protection does not get afforded to care home residents who are self-funders. People are telling me that they are struggling to keep up with the continuous rises in fees and are seeing all their money disappear on these rises. Often these are people who have worked hard, have saved up through their entire life, only to see that money now disappear on ever-increasing care home fees. And it's worth restating, these are not people with major wealth. These are people who have worked hard all their lives, saved a bit and bought their homes. They now need support and care and are told that they have to pay for it. And as costs go up but local authority fees remain stagnant, they are the only source of additional income for private care home operators. I say again, the residents and their families feel like they're being fleeced and they want the same protections as all other renters have. I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say on this matter. As I say, this cannot continue. These people cannot be ignored. And neither can the fact that the charges are continually being put up and it seems there's nothing they can do and nobody cares. Paul Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I rise to speak uh, in support of Willie, Mo Willie Rennie's motion and Miles Briggs's motion. Um, I don't think anyone really can argue the fact that housing associations and charities have worked extremely hard to meet the needs of their tenants, and they've struggled over previous years with rent caps. One of the big issues with the cost of living crisis is the fact that houses are incorrectly insulated. And that's why we need to invest on the insulation of houses. A survey in Wick alone that I carried out suggested there were 850 properties there owned by the council, of which 530 were below EPCC, which would cost in excess of £21 million to get up to the correct level. So we need to encourage landlords to invest in their properties. And I, along with many other Highland MSPs this morning, will have, had a dis have received a disturbing email from a housing association who is going to have to review their, their future investment in properties as a result of this legislation. What they have done, rightly so, is agreed a rent freeze this year, and we're looking to have a rent increase next year in line with inflation. That seemed to be sensible. They were helping the tenants this year in order to invest next year. Now they're in a position where they've helped the tenants this year they can't help them next year by investing in the, the fabric of their buildings because they won't be allowed to address the issue of rents. That's why I think we need to remove housing association and charities out of the bill at this stage so they can address that issue and carry on with that investment because if we don't give them certainty into the future, let me tell you the supply industry is such that any works that might be allowed if this rent freeze doesn't continue 
won't be able to programme because the materials won't be requisitioned early enough. So that's why I support uh, both of those amendments. And I believe the Parliament should too, because it is not only helping tenants, but it is addressing the problems of achieving uh, insulated properties, which is something that all across Scotland should be trying to achieve. Thank you, convener. Thank you. I call the minister. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, before I turn to the amendment specifically, can I just respond to those last points on energy efficiency? I think this government has given a very clear, not just indication, but clear commitment of investment on energy efficiency uh, right across uh, our built environment, but in particular in terms of social housing. Edward Mountain is quite right to draw attention to the critically important nature of, of that investment uh, in reducing our emissions, but also in reducing tenants' energy costs. And I would just uh, refer him to, to some of the comments that came from the Energy Efficiency Association just recently, uh, who, in giving advice to the UK government, uh, said that they should follow the Scottish government's lead uh, on the support that we're giving on that area. So, I, uh, if it's very brief. It, Edward, it is very you? brief, and, I, and I, I do understand the Scottish Government's wish to invest in housing, but old housing costs a lot of money. It's my estimate, having been a surveyor and having properties that need insulation, it costs forty to £50,000 to even get it up one level of EPC, and that is nowhere near what the Government is promising for each of these social houses. Minister. Well, I, I, I come now to the amendments themselves. Uh, and in response to that last point, I would remind the members moving amendments 4, 5, 21 and 23 uh, that fundamentally the commitment to a 0% rent cap for the first six months has reduced the rental income of no social landlord in Scotland uh, and no decision has been made about the future. We're uh, working very constructively uh, with the, the sector in order to inform those decisions. These four amendments, uh, numbers 4, 5, 21 and 23, would have the effect of removing registered social landlords, their wholly owned subsidiaries and local authorities from the rent cap. Now, as, uh, as we set out and as we discussed yesterday, uh, we proposed uh, applying that rent cap until the 31st of March in the first instance and having it separately variable between the private and social rented sectors in order to take account of the distinct nature of the sectors. That date was set with the social rented sector in mind because we're aware that rents set in this sector are generally not set until uh, the 1st of April and will not increase before then. We did this specifically to ensure that these emergency measures do not immediately impact on the finances uh, of the social rented sector without full consideration uh, of the, uh, the perspective of the sector. I give way to Mr Rennie. Willie Rennie. I mean, of course, he's, a he's absolutely right um, about that, but does he not accept the broader point that there is huge uncertainty and I know he's had good discussions with the sector but there's a good partnership in place they'll probably be given a bit of foresight about what's happened but you can't give them a guarantee that the cap won't extend beyond March and that uncertainty has a very long-term effect on planning of building new homes and maintenance and all the rest of the package so he does accept that point about uncertainty doesn't he Minister. Uh, I'm going to come on to, to some of the arguments around Mr Rennie's amendments and, and some of the reasons why I don't think his approach would give certainty uh, in the way that he suggests. We are firmly committed to working uh, with the sector uh, as well as supporting them to undertake meaningful consultations with tenants uh, while that work continues. And to drive that progress forward, we've established a so short life task and finish working group bringing together officials from government with leaders from across the sector to identify and consider the options available. Uh, and I have to say, presiding officer, every discussion that I've taken part in over recent weeks with the sector, uh, and I think it's true of the, the discussions the Cabinet Secretary has had as well, gives me great confidence that we can find a, a way through this that meets the needs of tenants in the sector who have that same expectation of uh, security uh, for themselves that other tenants do, as well as meeting the needs of the sector and the wider social purposes uh, of social housing. So I'm uh, uh, not able to support uh, the, the, these four amendments, 4, 5, 21 and 23, and would ask the members uh, responsible uh, not to press them. Uh, I'll turn now to amendments uh, 6, 16 and 24. 
Uh, I think these are all in Polly McNeill's name and raise a very substantive uh, issue. The aim of this bill is to protect tenants, helping them to stay in their homes during the cost crisis, stabilising their housing costs. And the average length of a tenancy in Scotland is around 18 months. So the emergency measures will provide protection uh, to the, the large majority uh, of tenants. The application of the rent freeze on this basis responds to the, the need to ensure that measures are proportionate. Pauline McNeill mentions the, the risk of illegal evictions. The additional penalties that are provided for in other parts of this bill uh, create a strong disincentive for landlords to pursue unlawful evictions. Uh, and she is quite right also to raise the issue about raising awareness within the sector uh, for tenants as well as landlords. Uh, and there are other uh, parts of the bill where we, where we will debate that. But prospective tenants entering into a new tenancy will do so on the basis of an agreed rent, and they will immediately have protection from any rent increase uh, as the measures in the bill will apply to their tenancy while in effect. Was there a request for a, an intervention there? Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Perhaps you have clarified at your last point, but I just want to make sure. Uh, so if a tenant's lease is due within the six months of the period of the bill, then the landlord could just not renew the lease. Are you saying that they would get the protection of this bill, that the rent would be frozen? Because if, if you're saying that, then I'm content. But if you're not saying that, then my point is valid, which is uh, between tenancies, um, there should be a rent freeze. Keep my point. Minister. Well, of course, the, the majority of tenants do have security of tenure. Uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's possible that there may be aspects of this that we need to continue to discuss with, with Pauline McNeill uh, over the course of the day. Uh, but as, as, as I said, uh, the uh, enforcement of a rent freeze or rent controls... Sorry, but point I, of I'm order, Edward Mountain. Point of order, Minister. Uh, um, I, I just want to clarify uh, that under the uh, latest legislation that the, the Minister would know that he is saying that tenants, tenants, tenancies will end. That, that, that's not true, because if that's what you just said, that's wrong. I just would like to clarify, Minister. Um, well, thank you. Um, it, I don't believe that is a point of order, but it is a debating point, Minister. Thank you. I, I don't believe it's a point of order, and I also don't believe it's what I said. But uh, to, to return to the, the points raised by Polly McNeill, uh, in tenancy, rent increases generally don't take place in the social rented sector either, and, and most rents uh, have, their, uh, uh, have been set annually from the 1st of April. Uh, I, I think in, in winding up on, on these particular amendments, there are very important longer-term arguments here uh, about the operation of the rented sector, and we'll continue to address those in our longer-term work uh, on permanent changes to legislation. But I'm afraid in the context of this emergency bill, uh, I am not able to support uh, the amendment uh, to extend the bill to enter tenancy rent increases, and so I uh, would ask uh, the member not to move those amendments, uh, and uh, if they are moved, uh, I, I will have to ask Parliament not to support them. Turning to amendments 9 and 10, again uh, from Pauline McNeill, uh, I am once again going to ask Pauline McNeill not to, to move uh, these amendments, but I, uh, I, I think we all do want to make sure that tenants are well informed. I, I think that this amendment uh, in particular is flawed in its references, and it will require to be mirrored in respect of uh, the provisions relating to the, uh, 1980, the, the 1988 uh, legislation, the tenancies under that legislation. However, uh, in looking at those issues, we would be content to bring back uh, uh, an amendment with uh, the correct references, addressing the points uh, that Pauline McNeill seeks to raise in 9 and 10, uh, bring those back at stage 3 tomorrow. Um, amendment 25, um, Willie Rennie uh, says that he's seeking uh, to achieve clarity. I don't believe that Amendment 25 would do that. It would require a lengthy notice period to be provided by the Scottish Ministers when laying regulations to modify the rent cap uh, for social tenancies. Now, clearly, Scottish ministers will, as I said, work closely with social landlords and tenants in social tenancies to discuss any changes to the rent cap, but this amendment would remove the ability of ministers to react to changing circumstances in order to protect the interests of landlords, where the cap must be increased. Equally, any future decrease in the rent cap, if it has already been increased, would, could not be actioned quickly 
due to this amendment. Uh, there are existing procedural safeguards in the Bill, uh, as the rent cap can only be increased via regulations subject to the affirmative procedure. So, in order to ensure that Scottish ministers can react quickly to changing circumstances, I can't support this amendment, and I would invite Willie Rennie not to press it. Uh, if it is pressed, I urge members to reject it. Turning to Amendment 26 uh, from uh, Miles Briggs, uh, this amendment also we can't agree with in its current form, but uh, again, I think it raises an important uh, issue. We agree it needs to be addressed, and therefore we will bring a Stage 3 amendment to allow rent uh, notice increases to be issued uh, for the social sector if the cap is lifted one month before 1st of April 2023, to allow social landlords to issue rent increase notices in time for these to take effect uh, on the 1st of April. Uh, this is an important issue, and, and as I say, uh, we intend to address it uh, tomorrow at stage three. I hope Miles Briggs will accept that position. Uh, convener, uh, Amendment 31, uh, I'm afraid I also cannot accept. Uh, it, there is a, a very understandable desire, as we debate emergency legislation in relation to the cost of living, uh, to widen that debate out beyond uh, rented housing. Uh, but I'm afraid it's not uh, something that we're able to do, and this amendment very clearly does widen it out beyond the issue of rented housing. There are some really key differences between people in rented housing and a care home, which means it's not appropriate to address this issue within this bill relating to the protection of tenants. In a care home, the purpose of the accommodation is the provision of a service. Uh, and therefore, their charges are an amalgamation of services and accommodation. It covers food, heating, care and support and other workforce costs, amongst other elements. Care homes do not offer tenancies. Uh, instead, residents have a residency agreement that sets out, amongst other things, services that will be, be provided, payment fees and charges uh, and notice and termination periods for the residency agreement. The Government recognises that care home fees can be high for independently funded supported people, and this is why the free personal and nursing care rates have been increased by more than, more than the inflationary measure for the last two years. And we continue to work. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the Minister for taking an intervention on this point. Um, does the, is the Minister not aware that the, some of the, the reasons that care home costs are so high are because they have ancillary costs attached, like the Minister has just described, including rent? And it's quite easy, easy to subtract that from um, their usual bills. Minister. I, 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 I'm afraid that in the context of this amendment, I don't think this amendment offers an easy way to disambiguate those costs. Uh, uh, we will continue to work with the UK Government to address the increasing energy costs that the sector are facing in order to mitigate uh, any impact from that on increasing fees. Uh, having said that, I'm afraid I must, uh, if, if there's time for a final intervention. Alex Rowley. Can I ask, I mean, the, the real important point to bring in this amendment here is to raise the plight of those self-funders, because you know, one person wrote to me, their costs went up from 2669 to 2786 to 32. Two, one, all within the period of six months. So, are, is the government aware of the massive pressures that are being put on self-funders and the fact that they are the only people that seem to be asked to be paying the price? Because the government and local authorities have not put up the cost for care home for, 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 for people that are receiving state funding. It is simply these self-funders. Are you aware of that? Minister. The, the government is, of course, uh, aware of the impact of, of people in care homes and the, the issues uh, that uh, the member raises. I say again, I am afraid that these do go significantly beyond the issue of rented housing, uh, which this bill seeks uh, to address. And I would suggest that the member engages in dialogue with the, the Minister for Social Care in order to address those issues further. I entirely respect the intention with which he has raised them, but they go beyond uh, the, the purpose uh, of this bill, I am afraid. And, uh, I would urge the member not to uh, move that amendment, and if he does, I'm afraid I must ask the chamber uh, not to support it. Thank you. I call on Miles Briggs to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 4. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, it is my intention to press Amendment 4 and ask members also to support Willie Rennie's Amendment 5. This is our one opportunity to try to remove the social rented sector from this bill, and members across the Parliament need to take that because the damage it will do, including them and not seeing 
the future investment which is so vitally needed for all our communities is unacceptable. So I hope we will see them removed and members will consider that. Um, I also will be moving Amendment 23, but given what the Minister has said with regards to Amendment 26, I'm happy not to move that one um, and take forward discussions, I hope, before Stage uh, 3 tomorrow. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The committee is not agreed. We'll move to a vote. And members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Edward Mike. For some reason, I don't be able to vote, uh, connect to the voting app. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Mary McCallan. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number four in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 30, no 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment five in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with amendment four. Willie Rennie to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, the committee is not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Bob Doris. 
the digital platform, I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Fiona Hislop. My vote couldn't be cast. I would, I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Liam MacArthur. Um, my app wasn't connecting to the system either, and I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number five in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, 31, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment six in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment four. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Uh, not move, and then not move, and can I apologise to you, Convener, and the rest of the Chamber that I should have drawn members' attention to my register of interest as an owner of a rented property in North Lanarkshire Council, and I apologise for not doing so at the start of the debate. Thank you, Mr Griffin. And we now move to the next group, Landlord Protection. I call Amendment 8 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 8 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I would like to speak to Amendments 8, 11, 12, 13, 18, 19 and 20. Uh, these amendments would allow the landlord to apply to the rent officer for a rent increase that would cover 100% of any increased property cost. This will ensure that the tenancy remains financially viable for the landlord and the increased costs associated to the property can be paid to ensure the ongoing quality of the property. It will also, I think, have the positive effect of not making the tenant having to leave the property. As it stands, the government have put in a figure of 50%, but in my view, with the situation we are over the next few months, this will still cause problems. Uh, this view was highlighted to me uh, yesterday evening as I was going home on the bus. Uh, I was a bit surprised that one of my constituents had actually engaged and listened to the debate and decided to discuss it with me on my way home. And their example was this. They had a property here in Edinburgh that they had bought for a relation with a mortgage. That relation has now died and so a tenant has gone in to that property and is living there. However, the uh, individual is not particularly well off and it is the mortgage and the other costs that cover the, 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 the rent covers the person's mortgage. Without that rent, they can't pay the mortgage yep. and would then have to hand that back and sell the property. They are expecting over the next couple of months to see their mortgage go up. That will mean that under this bill, they will have to apply. Minister. I, I, I wonder, as a number of members are, are already commenting, if the, if the member would at least reflect and acknowledge what it is that is the cause uh, of the increases that the member is referring to and where the political responsibility for those reckless choices lies. Jeremy Balfour. I, I, I do find this an interesting narrative coming from Scottish Government. I was elected to this Parliament to represent my constituents and to make decisions. Nonsense. Mr Youssef. Uh, does the Minister want to intervene or does he just want to shout? Hamza Youssef. I'm happy to intervene to say it's your constituents, my constituents, who are facing mortgage rises because of your party's economic vandalism. Through the chair, please, Mr. Mr. Youssef. No doubt the uh, interest rates increases across Western Europe 
or what to do with Westminster as well. That's a fact. Oh, I see. Reality deniers. Let's listen to Mr. Balfour. Thank you, Convener. Convener, can I come back to my constituent? Because after all, we're here to represent them, not make cheap political points. So my constituent has informed me. Uh, obviously, the committee don't want to hear this. But, but my constituent has informed me that any rise in mortgage, for whatever reason, will mean that they will have to go and use the, the uh, section within the bill to show financial hardship yep. and will have to then evict the tenant to sell the property. I suspect, and having had several other emails as this debate has been going on this afternoon, from again constituents within Lothian, that will not, they will not be the only one that does this. If the government wants to carry on this policy, which, as we've heard from other parties, may well be challenged in court, and let's be honest, the Scottish government getting bills legally right is not good, but if we are going to pursue this policy, let's at least protect the landlord from not having to sell property because of a financial situation that they have not created. We're not asking for profit. We're not asking that anyone goes and benefits financially from this. We are simply covering the costs. And the Scottish Government cannot see that as a fair and reasonable thing to do. Mark Griffin. Jeremy Balfour makes the point that a landlord shouldn't face hardship because of costs that outweigh their control, and they should be allowed to then sell that property um, to, to recover those costs. Why should a, a tenant be made homeless by a landlord selling a property because of costs and things happening outweigh their control? Jeremy Balfour. We're trying, I don't think we, uh, member of the respect, quite understands what we're trying to do. We're trying to stop that. Yeah. We're trying to stop the tenant having to leave the property yeah. because the landlord simply can't afford to pay his or her mortgage. And that is a situation that will happen. Because <laughs> if that doesn't happen, the bank or building society will come and take the property off them. The, my constituent on the bus will then have a negative credit bearing and the tenant will still be evicted. Yeah. It's a lose-lose situation. I believe that this is a, a reasonable amendment which will protect tenants and landlords for the next six to 18 months and will allow people to plan with certainty that they will not lose their property. And for that reason, Convener, I ask this committee to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 14 and other amendments in the group. Amendment um, groups 3, 4, 5 and 6 create, um, have a, a number of amendments that work across um, the groups which are, are linked together. Uh, amendments in um, this group and the, the following groups um, ensure that um, exceptions related to substantial arrears and financial hardship on part of landlords can only apply where um, a high test of financial hardship applies as a result um, of those substantial arrears. We are saying that uh, landlords should not just Okay, we're going to have a brief suspension while I check the papers here.
Okay, apologies to the committee and in particular to Mark Griffin, um, uh, who tried to style it out, I thought, commendably. Um, my mistake, I now call Murdo Fraser to speak to Amendment 28 and other amendments in the grouping. Mr Fraser. Uh, well, thank you, Commissioner. I think that's a perfect illustration of what happens when you try and rush legislation through Parliament without proper scrutiny uh, and consultation. Uh, can I, before I come to amendments in the group, I should remind members that it's my first contribution of my register of interests. I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, and I have an interest in two properties uh, which are let on a long-term basis. I have three amendments uh, in this group. My amendments 28 and 29 uh, cover essentially uh, the same uh, point. The bill, as it is presented, uh, provides that in the private uh, rented uh, sector. Uh, landlords are able to increase rents to cover up to 50% of uh, increased costs, for example, finance costs or uh, insurance premiums uh, increasing. But that uh, provision only applies to the private rented sector. It does not apply, as the bill stands, to the social rented sector. And what my uh, amendments 28 and 29 seek to do is extend this particular measure to also cover the social rented sector. Now, we heard in the stage one debate uh, yesterday, uh, convener, uh, a number of members from all different political parties speaking about the importance of the social rented sector. And I think that is a view uh, widely shared across the chamber. And therefore, I hope there will be some sympathy for uh, social landlords who will face similar pressures to private landlords in terms of uh, increasing costs, whether that's in terms of finance or insurance premiums and elsewhere. And therefore, these two amendments from me seek to give uh, social landlords that uh, additional protection that already applies in the private rented sector. Amendment uh, 29 is my preferred amendment. It provides that social landlords would have 100% uh, protection from increased costs. But an alternative which members might find more amenable is my amendment 28, which restricts that protection to 50% in line with what is provided for private landlords. And I would simply observe that the uh, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations in their briefing for the debate this afternoon uh, have expressed support for my Amendment 28 and I'd encourage members to listen uh, to what they have to say on this particular point. My third amendment, Amendment 30, deals with a, a slightly uh, different uh, point. The uh, rent freeze encapsulated in this bill relates to any sums which are paid by the tenant to the landlord. And in some tenancies, the cost of utilities such as gas or electricity will be charged separately and will therefore be caught by uh, the rent freeze. As drafted in Schedule 1 of the Bill, uh, the uh, rent freeze would also apply to utility charges arising from the tenant's use, except where these are deemed to be excessive. So where a landlord uh, sees a large increase in utility costs, as it stands, they are not permitted to pass that on to the tenant unless the tenant's use of these utilities is excessive. Now, my difficulty with this, convener, is we do not know what is meant in this bill by the word excessive. And perhaps the minister, in responding, can tell us what is an excessive use of utilities. There's nothing in the policy memorandum that indicates what that might be the cost. Would it be 10% above the norm, 50% above the norm, 100% above the norm? What is the definition of excessive? Uh, and it does seem unreasonable that the landlord is not able uh, to pass on uh, any increase in utility costs except where it's excessive when we don't know what excessive means. So my proposal is we remove the word excessive, which is not defined, and that ensures that the tenant who is using utilities pays for the utilities, and the tenant's use of the utilities is not billed to the landlord, which it seems to me is what happens in terms of the bill as drafted. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I, I now call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 72 and other amendments in the group. Mr Green. Uh, thank you. I'll only speak to my own amendment, uh, convener. Um, I feel like the odd one out because I've got no interest to declare in rental properties. Um, thank you. I'm glad I'm not alone. It seems, it seems to be the SMB benches have more of them than I do, but there you are. Not pointing at anyone, uh, third row up on the right. Um, no, no, on, on, a, on a serious note, I'm, I, I, I do want to say that I do have an interest in the proceedings today. And that interest actually is that my mother lives in a, a housing association home, and I have actually quite grave concerns about the state of it. Um, the necessary upgrades that she and many of her neighbours and many in my community will need 
uh, particularly around issues around insulation, vital upgrades to their heating and windows and doors, all necessary upgrades which will help insulate the homes, make uh, their heating costs lower and help our whole country meet our net zero targets. I think all of that is clearly at risk given how we've just voted on Amendment 4 in the name of my colleague uh, Miles Briggs who I commend for bringing that forward. Housing associations are on the record, we've all had correspondence from them and I hope we've all read them, are on the record as being explicitly clear about the risk uh, to those vital upgrades and investments in current stock property, not new property, in current stock. Much of it is old, ageing and dilapidating. I know that because I've seen the insides of many of them, as I'm sure we all have. I want to talk to my Amendment 72 here because it's based on the following quite simple assumptions. The first is that what the government is doing today is seeking to use the law to cap the amount of rental income that a private, private landlord uh, can charge. Fine. Two, many landlords, not all, will have used buy-to-let mortgages to fund the purpose, uh, purchase of those properties. That is a fact too. Three, there is often a very direct financial correlation between the amount of rent received from that rental property and the amount of the mortgage income. In fact, for many, it's a simple pass-through between the rental income and the outgoings of the mortgage payment. There's not often or always even profit involved for many uh, small landlords. And four, and this is the point of my amendment, that if the rental income, as a result of a cap that the government has induced, is less than the amount of the mortgage that is payable on that property, then I believe that, that will cause uh, financial issues for the property owner, potentially putting them at risk of defaulting on the debt and, at worst case, put the property itself at risk. Why? Because mortgages are contracts, big financial contracts between a borrower and a lender. And the borrower runs the very same risk as anyone else of falling foul of such a contract for non-payment or if they cannot afford to make the payments. My view today... Uh, uh, yes, happily. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Thompson. Ms Thompson, is your card you. Sorry, member. Sorry, thank you. Uh, in that exact circumstance you outlined, the real issue actually is Section 24 of the 2015 Finance Bill in Westminster that means that those costs can't be offset as a legitimate business expense. So perhaps you should clarify for everyone here. In other words, Westminster legislation has greatly contributed to that situation. Can I remind members to talk through the chair? Jamie Green. Uh, the member, uh, 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 I'm, I'm not sure she declared her interest at the beginning of that intervention, but it's really scraping the barrel here. What we're talking about is her front bench introducing legislation which is capping the amount of revenue that can be charged for a rental property. At the same time, that same landlord, who may only have one property, also has a mortgage to pay in that property. It's a direct correlation. That's the correlation I'm pointing to today, and that's the point of which my amendment is all about. And if the member wants to listen carefully, I will share my philosophical view about this. Because if the government, if the government, her government, introduces a policy which caps rental revenue, then it should pay for it, not the wider public, and certainly not those people who will be affected by the policy. Happy to give way again. Cabinet Secretary. So I just want to make sure that we're understanding this amendment and the purpose of it clearly. Um, so as we know, it's been referred to by other members, the UK Tory government has literally trashed the economy. And one of the, one of the results of that, as Jamie Green knows, is a massive rise in interest rates, putting people's home at risk and indeed putting up the mortgage costs of landlords, which is the point of his amendment, the cost to landlords, correct? That is the point of his amendment. So the Tories, the Scottish Tories are now coming to this chamber with an amendment that wants to put Scotland's public finances in place to pay for that Tory incompetence by having to pay for any rise in interest rates for landlords' mortgages. I've, that's what the amendment says. It wants a scheme to be set up using public money to pay for any increase in the interest rates for landlords' mortgages in order to cover that, which, of course, is directly related to the economic folly of the Tory government. I think that is quite an incredible amendment for the Scottish Tories to come to this chamber with. And it would be good if Jamie Ginn could clarify if that's exactly what his amendment is trying to do. 
Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. There is an opportunity for any member who wishes to press their button to speak in this debate. Um, so interventions should be interventions rather than speeches. Jamie Green. Thank, thank you, Convener. The member is welcome to participate in the debate. In one second, colleague. The, the member is welcome to participate in the, the, the debate and not give len lengthy grievance rattled speeches about Westminster, Tory governments, Tory this, Tory that. No, because we've heard quite enough, Minister. We've heard quite enough. The point I'm making, and I'm happy to answer your question directly, and then I'll take another intervention, is that this is this government's policy to introduce a cap on the amount of revenue that can be gained from rent. It is this government's policy, for whatever the rights and wrongs of it, and we can have a debate about that. But if that means that that puts the property at risk, which it very, very well may do, and I'm going to come on to the evidence based behind that in a second, if the Minister wants to listen, then that is a problem. I'm simply saying that why should the public pay the price for that policy and not the government, because it is the government's policy to induce that cap and not the public's. Um, I'm happy to give way to Mr Briggs. Miles Briggs. In this amendment, because I listened to the flawed logic of the Cabinet Secretary there, what she is basically saying also applies to the social rental sector. So in other words, it is this SNP Green government which are trashing the social rental sector in Scotland. Exactly. Jamie exactly. Green. And, and, and the, sad, the sad truth, uh, Mr Briggs, is that you're right, because um, if we're in a scenario, if we're in a scenario where as a result of the cap, our social housing, social housing providers cannot put the vital investment they need into uh, degrading housing stock, then on their heads be it. Um, we do know, uh, presiding officer, that we could be in a situation uh, where landlords simply cannot afford to pay their mortgages or other costs. Now, there is some provision in the bill around that, I accept that, but I simply don't think it goes uh, far enough. We don't want to see uh, them getting into uh, difficulties. Uh, and what we certainly don't want as a byproduct of legislation is for the property market stock to reduce, because therein lies some real issues. And that's a point that I think will be made over the course of the debate today. I also just want to close by, um, just one second, I want to close by, by just in the interest of time, we will be here all night, um, is that uh, I did get an email from a, a landlady in my, my region who wanted me to, to pass on the following to the government. She said, I am a landlady with only one rental property, which is my only source of income. Not being able to put up the rent or indeed evic evict non-payers could put me into a difficult situation or near bankrupt bankruptcy. I'm already near that stage, she says. She wants me to make this point to the government. Not all landlords are big portfolio owners. Not all landlords are big portfolio landlords with lots of money. She says a lot of landlords are just everyday people with a little money. And this blanket policy does not fairly consider the thousands of landlords across Scotland who also are struggling. And she's absolutely right. Why are we not listening to them? Yes, happily. Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green makes an important point, and it was absolutely for that reason about the landlady that, that uh, Jamie Green refers to that the safeguards are in this bill for that very scenario. And I hope that he will reassure her that those safeguards are there for exactly that type of scenario, because that is important that we all reassure our constituents where we get the opportunity. Absolutely. Jamie Green. Uh, I'm glad the, the, the Minister mentions uh, the, the, the safeguards. Uh, it, as far as I can see from Section 33A, that they are capped at 50 per cent of a rise in costs and the rent can only go up by a maximum of 3%. If I'm wrong on that, I'm happy to stand corrected. But that's actually, for many, may not simply be enough, uh, which, is, which is why uh, my, my amendment still stands. All I would say in closing is that th this is a, a choice of the government's own path of choosing, as I said, whatever the rights and wrongs of it, and, and, and people have different views on it. I'm simply saying they should pay for it, or at least be honest with people and say to landlords, if you disagree with my, my, my amendment, be upfront and clear with them and say to them, we're asking you, in fact, we're expecting you to pay for our policy. Be honest and be upfront about that. Uh, that's all I have to say on the matter. Thanks. Thank you, Mr Green. I now call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I wasn't planning to speak in this um, group until you called me by surprise, but since the debate <laughs> has continued in this way, I, I feel like I have to, and I have to come to speak to Amendment 72 in the name of Jamie Green. I absolutely cannot believe that a Conservative MSP would table an amendment which would give public subsidy to a private landlord struggling with their mortgage, which is a direct 
footfall of his government's action in pushing up interest rates. I, I, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that, not at the moment, I cannot believe that the Conservative Party's priority is to protect landlords from rising interest rates, but have no plans whatsoever, have put forward no proposals to support the many thousands of households, hundreds of thousands of households, who are paying the price for his government's ineptitude and interest rates and mortgage rates skyrocketing. Thank you, President Officer. I now call the uh, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Clearly, uh, this group uh, has opened up the opportunity for some of the fundamental differences in approach that were debated yesterday again to be heard. And it's obviously welcome to have that, that robust exchange of views. We have very divergent uh, opinions. Uh, well, I, I suspect it's very divergent opinions between the Conservatives and the rest of us uh, in this chamber on the fundamentals, even if uh, other colleagues may disagree on some of the details. I think we're uh, mostly on the same page on the fundamentals. Uh, and in addressing, first of all, the amendments from Mr. Balfour, I want to uh, look back to, to some of the last comments from, from Mr. Green about balance. Fundamentally, in crafting this bill, we have had to ensure that there is a balance of interests between landlords and tenants. That is the purpose of the package of safeguards that we built into this bill, precisely to recognise what Mr Green says, that not all landlords are hugely wealthy, hugely profitable businesses with very extensive property portfolios. Some are, but some are the, the kind of person that, that Mr Green describes. And the package of safeguards in this bill is precisely designed to address that. And indeed, the Scottish Association of Landlords have recognised that. Uh, John Blackwood uh, on the radio this morning uh, said we all support the idea that tenants do need protection and he went on to say certainly we do welcome the mitigations in the bill uh, and on, on several occasions Mr Blackwood has, has uh, outside of that interview has recognised the work that the government has done uh, to produce a balanced package and indeed if we hadn't produced a balanced package uh, we would not have been able to satisfy ourselves or satisfy the presiding officer uh, that this bill is within competence. It has to achieve that balance in order to be within competence, and it does. I give way. Uh, Jamie Green. Can I first of all thank the Minister for acknowledging that I, I, I bring forward the amendment in good faith as a result of the feedback that I'm getting, but does he also recognise that the same John Blackwood also was explicitly clear that uh, with these challenges, some landlords will soon find themselves in financial difficulty and ultimately having to make that decision to take action by either selling the property or exiting the sector. And that's surely something, something that none of us in the Chamber want. We don't want to see that reduction in the, in the private stock because it is needed whether we like it or not. Minister. None of us uh, want to see anybody in this country facing financial hardship and I only wish both governments were acting uh, with, uh, with due regard uh, to that risk. I'll come, on to, I'll come on to Mr Green's amendment uh, it's, itself, but I wanted to address those wider points about balance, first of all, because they do relate also to Mr Balfour's uh, amendments. So I'm speaking, first of all, to amendments 8, 11, 12, 13, 18, 19 and 20. Mr Balfour uh, clearly once again sets out quite fairly, and it's within his right to do so, that he is fundamentally uh, against uh, the, the, the measures in this bill, doesn't support the measures that we're taking to protect tenants. Uh, but I would uh, urge him, as well as others, uh, to recognise the, the comments that Scottish Association of Landlords have made about the balanced package of safeguards that exist. He's concerned about people facing costs out with their control, but he seems only to be concerned about landlords facing costs out with their control. Uh, and I think Mr Griffin was quite right to pick him up that we should be concerned about landlords and tenants. And it is that balance, it is that balance that this, I will in just a moment, it is that balance that this 50% figure seeks to recognise to ensure that if there are these increases in prescribed limited costs, they will be balanced between landlord and tenant. I give way. Jeremy Balfour. Would the, does the Minister concede and accept that if the landlord cannot pay his mortgage, the tenant is very likely to face eviction. So this is not just about supporting the landlord, yeah. that the, the consequence of the landlord not being able to pay a mortgage will be the tenant will be evicted. 
Minister. And without once again getting into the, the, the politics of the, the reasons behind that rise uh, in, in interest rates, uh, it's worth reflecting on the fact that the majority of private rented uh, tenancies in Scotland do not have a mortgage sat behind them. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of those that do will be on a fixed rate, which will not be due to change uh, in the immediate period ahead. And so the, the approach that we've taken is, as I say, balanced and recognises that where there are increased costs, there needs to be some degree of flexibility, but it needs to work in a way that is, that is balanced. I turn to amendments uh, 28, 29 and 30. Uh, I think in many ways these will, well, 28 and 29 in the first instance, these will cut across, uh, I think, the work that we and the social rented sector uh, are committed to doing collectively, collaboratively, through that short life working group that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, I, as I said, I get a sense that there is a real willingness to work in that collaborative spirit uh, to ensure that there's a, a way forward that protects tenants as well as the providers of social housing. Uh, the, the amendments uh, proposed at 28 and 29 uh, would not be the, the, the way that we uh, think that the, the protection for the social rented sector would, ha would work. In fact, I think it might undermine and preempt uh, the work that we intend to do. And we intend to take that forward uh, with momentum. Amendment 30, uh, I, in relation to student uh, tendencies, it's important to recognise that they're structured differently. Uh, we have uh, the desire to offer a parity of protection, but student tenancies often include energy costs. Uh, we've uh, defined rent for this sector to make it clear that rent includes uh, the sums payable in respect of services, repairs, maintenance or insurance. But where utilities are included in the rent and a student makes excessive use of them, then it's right and fair uh, that an accommodation provider can seek recovery. Uh, just a moment, I'll, I'll make some progress. Can seek recovery uh, of this uh, from the tenant where that tenancy allows it. Mr Fraser's amendment would create a loophole. It would allow providers to circumvent the rent freeze by increasing the utility of the rent uh, even if it's being used normally rather than excessively. And in terms of the questions around definition that Mr Fraser raised, this is part of the contract. It wouldn't be appropriate uh, to apply a global definition uh, of, of those issues within the legislation because it's provided for within individual contracts governing uh, purpose-built student accommodation. And I finally... Yes, I will. Murder Fraser. Grateful to the Minister for uh, the explanation he has just given, but he's just said this will be a matter for the contract. So is he saying it's a matter, therefore, for the accommodation provider, the landlord, the university, the, it might be a private uh, company that's developed student flats, for example, to specify what would be excessive use. So if they said it's 5% above the trend, that would be acceptable. Minister. The existing contracts stand. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, the, uh, the, the existing contracts allow the providers uh, to charge extra fees for excessive use, uh, and uh, the, um, the, the provisions would be interpreted in that context. I'll turn finally to Amendment 72. Amendment 72, the, the Cabinet Secretary was, was quite right to challenge the, the fundamentals of the idea uh, that the public purse uh, should pay for people's mortgage costs. But I, I think perhaps even the Cabinet Secretary was a little bit kind uh, in this instance, uh, referring to interest. Because the amendment from Jamie Green, I'm going to quote for it, Scottish ministers must make a scheme or schemes for the making of payments to landlords who are able to demonstrate that their monthly mortgage payments uh, uh, exceed the rental income. The monthly mortgage payments. So not just the interest, yeah. but the repayment mortgage payments mm -hmm. would be covered by this amendment. What Mr Green is arguing is that while he says that these costs should not fall on the wider public, that's precisely who these costs would fall on. Public the Scottish debt. Government holds the public purse. The Scottish Government holds money on behalf of the wider public, and he's asking for that to be dipped into to repay the personal debt of landlords, not to service their interest payments, but to service all of their monthly mortgage payments. The idea, the idea 
uh, that we use public funds in that way uh, is astonishing. It's astonishing from somebody on the right of the political spectrum. It's certainly astonishing to the rest of us. And I give way. Jamie Green. I, I think Mr Har Harvey fails to acknowledge or accept that it is his, this is his policy, this is his government's policy to cap rents, to cap the amount that can be charged. Now, I'm simply making the point that that may be fine when those two numbers match, but when the payments by the landlord are higher than the cap that his government have introduced, then it is his government's policy which is undermining the borrower's ability to keep up those payments. It's his government's policy that I'm asking him to pay for, not the wider public. Minister. I, I, I might take this argument seriously if it had come from the, the kind of tenants' rights campaigner who would say it was uh, unacceptable uh, at a time when mortgage payments were less than rental income that that should be repaid to the tenant or repaid to the public trust. But I don't think that's Mr Green's position in relation to how private renting ought to work. And the idea, the idea that we have public payment for people's repayment of people's mortgages in these circumstances is astonishing. We've seen unfunded tax cuts coming from the Conservative Party recently, but the idea of unfunded repayment of landlords' mortgages, uh, I think, is astonishing. And who would end up repaying? It would be those who benefit from the services that this government would have to cut in order to fund this uncosted bill. Who should be paying for that? Should we pay for that by scrapping the Scottish child payment? Should we pay for it by scrapping free prescription charges? No. This government has brought forward a balanced bill which reflects both the interests of tenants who need protection from rising rents in these difficult times and landlords, not all of whom are in the same circumstances. This bill is balanced already. Uh, this amendment would unbalance it fatally. And I urge members to reject all the amendments in this group. Thank you. So, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, to wind up, people withdraw uh, Amendment 8. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Camilla. Uh, I will be brief. I think in the last uh, 20 to 30 minutes we've seen this bill simply collapse. <laughs> and we've seen it collapse by the Minister's interventions and his speech. Yep. Did you notice, convener, how often he mentions the word, this is legally competent? Well, let's wait and see a few months in regard yep. to that. Yep. And I have to say, I have a lot of respect for Mark Griffin. And I generally think he's hopefully just missing uh, the point on this. And that is, the issue is here, the issue is here, that we are trying to protect the tenant from being evicted from their property. And without the 100% guarantee for that, yeah. as uh, my colleagues Murda Fraser and Jamie Green have said, we will end up with more people being evicted yes. from property. Uh, why not? Yes. Uh, Bob Doris. I'm wondering if the member thinks that reinstating universal credit cuts and uprating benefits by inflation would do more to protect tenants from eviction than your lousy amendments? Oh, Through the chair, please. Through the chair, please. Jeremy Balfour. Right. Um, again, I think Mr Doris is better than that intervention. Yeah. And I think Mr Dollish maybe want to go and stand for the Westminster Parliament if he's so keen. We have a Scottish Parliament and we're dealing with this bill here today. And maybe he should concentrate on this bill rather than... And if he wants to go to Westminster, go and do that. What we, what we have seen in regard to the responses to this amendment is political dogma over pragmatism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what we have seen... What we have seen today from the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary is frankly a, p a party that is happy to go with dogma, even if it means more people are homeless. Yes. And that, I'm afraid, right. is where this government has got to today. And I move uh, Amendment 8 in my name, Convener. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The question is, that Amendment 8 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We, will, we are not agreed. We will move to a vote. Members should vote. Members should vote now.
That's the vote closed. The result on the vote on amendment number 8 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes 27, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. I call amendment 9 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with amendment 4. Polly McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. That amendment is not moved. The question is that amendment uh, 10 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with amendment uh, 4. Uh, Polly McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 11 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 4, Jeremy Balfour to move or not? Uh, move? Not moved. That amendment is not moved. I call amendment, amendment 12 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment um, 8, Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, Commissioner, not moved. And if it would be helpful, uh, Amendment 13, 18, 19 and 20, I will not be moving. That may be helpful. Unfortunately, they're not in a row, and therefore I'm not able to take up your kind offer. Um, amendment. So it's not moved. That so it's not moved. Yeah. Question uh, is Amendment 13 be agreed? No, no, no. See what you've done now, Jeremy Balfour. <laughs> amendment is. Uh, the question is Amendment. 13, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, uh, already moved uh, with debate with Amendment 8. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not? Not move. Um, the uh, right. the amendment, I call Amendment 14, in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 15 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 16 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 4. Polly McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I, I, um, I call Amendment 17 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Uh, and Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Um, I call Amendment 18 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with uh, Amendment 8. Jeremy Balfour to move on. No, it is not moved. I call Amendment uh, 19 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 8. Jeremy not Balfour. moved. It is not moved. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 8. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with Amendment 4. Willie Rennie to move or not move? That moved. Is that is moved. The um, question is that. Point, just point out the preemption. Ah, I need to point out, yes. Um, I should point out the amendment 21, uh, if it's agreed to, I cannot call amendments 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27 due to a preemption. Um, the question is that uh, amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a vote, and members should cast their votes now. That's the vote closed.
Okay, the result of the vote on Amendment No. 21 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes 31, no 84. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 4. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Uh, moved. That is uh, moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a vote, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote's closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 23 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 48, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, not agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 4. Polly McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with Amendment uh, 4. Willie Rennie to move or not move? It moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not uh, agreed. There will be a vote, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. Point of order, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thanks very much. My uh, unfortunate voting app wouldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Halker Johnson. I'll make sure that is uh, taken into account. Point of order, Maggie Chapman. I don't think my vote registered. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I'll make sure that that is taken account of. Okay, the result on, of the vote on Amendment uh, Number 25 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, uh, 51, no, uh, 65. There were no abstentions. Um, that amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 26 in the name of Miles Briggs. Are any debate with Amendment 4? Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, in light of the Minister's commitment for Stage 3, not moved. 
That is not moved. Um, I call Amendment 27 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment uh, 1. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Um, I call Amendment 28 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 8. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that uh, Amendment 28 is agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a vote and members should cast their votes now. And that vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 28 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes 49, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, not agreed to. Um, I call amendment 29 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 8. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is um, that amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a vote and members should cast their votes now. That's the vote closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 29 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes 31, no 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I, I call Amendment 30 in the name of Murdo Fraser. Already debated with Amendment 8. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. Um, uh, the question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Uh, there will be a division and uh, members should cast their votes now.
That is the vote closed. The result of the vote on Amendment 30 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes 29, no 81. Uh, there were no abstentions. Uh, that amendment is not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 31 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 4. Alec Rowley to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. That is the vote closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 31 in the name of Alec Rowley is yes 19, no 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment uh, is therefore not agreed. Um, I call amendment 32 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment 1. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. That is not moved. Uh, the question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. There will be a brief pause um, before we move on to the next grouping. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I would move on now and I call uh, the group operation of evictions moratorium. I call amendment 33 in the name of Murdo Fraser, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Murdo Fraser to move amendment 33 and speak to all amendments in this group. Thank you, Convener. I will just speak to amendment uh, 33. I will let others speak to their own amendments. Uh, schedule uh, 2, paragraph 1, deals with the issue of protection from evictions, uh, seeking to protect those who have eviction notices served on or after the 6th of September uh, 2022. Uh, I, I understand why the Government has brought this particular uh, measure in. I also understand why it has been backdated to the 6th of September, which uh, was the day that the First Minister intimated that. Uh, the eviction ban would come in, and that has been introduced as an anti-avoidance measure. And uh, subparagraph 2 of paragraph 1 of Schedule 2 makes specific mention of eviction notices served on or after the uh, 6th September 2022 uh, not being valid in effect because they are uh, caught by the eviction ban. Now, it is uh, inferred uh, in the uh, bill that therefore eviction notices served before the 6th of September 2022 will not be caught by this. However, I think it would be helpful 
if that was put upon the face of the bill. And what my amendment uh, 33 seeks to do is just make it explicit that any eviction notice served uh, uh, before the 6th of September will not be caught by the eviction ban. And that protects those who uh, had to take action to remove tenants for various purposes, perhaps for uh, a long period of non-payment of rent, perhaps for antisocial behaviour, perhaps for other purposes, uh, had to take action to remove a tenant before that date. I think it's very clear from the policy memorandum that accompanies the bill, paragraph 42, that there is no intention that this bill should catch eviction notices prior to the 6th of September, and therefore I would hope this, this particular amendment would have the government's support. And I move that amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sorry, convener. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. I call Stephen Kerr to speak to Amendment 34 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Kerr. I can mean I am afraid that once again we're making bad law by the way that we're rushing this through um, all of the stages of uh, legislation today. Um, and I'm astonished that so few members in this place seem to read the business pages of any decent newspapers so they could understand that interest rates are not simply rising here but across the entire advanced global economy. This amendment, which is number 34, and I also speak to number 44, um, is on the basis that I believe that universities should be able to evict students who have breached tenancy agreements. Tenancy agreements will often contain terms and conditions to ensure students aren't disruptive to others and aren't committing antisocial behaviour. University Scotland has specifically made it clear that universities have to retain the power to remove students from accommodation where they pose a risk, violent or sexual, to other students. They highlighted this in their briefing uh, is a, as a particular problem in university halls. Yes, I will. I Joseph wonder if the member Joseph might, might uh, recognise that the briefing came before the bill was fully published. Uh, Stephen Kerr? I, I do recognise that, but nevertheless the briefing is still pretty largely relevant, and particularly in relation to this amendment, because the bill states that students can be evicted for a relevant conviction, which means an offence committed by using or allowing the use of the let property for an immoral or illegal purpose or any offence which was punishable by prison. The bill defines antisocial behaviour as doing something which causes or is likely to cause the other person alarm, distress, nuisance or annoyance. But this may not cover all students who pose a risk to others. And so the reason that I'm bringing this amendment is that I believe, as does University of Scotland, that it is necessary to give universities the power to evict students who pose a risk to others. Yeah, yeah. This is a very reasonable and reasoned amendment. Mm -hmm. So my amendment will simply allow institutions the ability to make judgments on evicting people from purpose-built student accommodation. And for me, this amendment is primarily about trust and it's about protection. It's about protection of young people some of whom can be very vulnerable as they take their first tentative steps away from home. Yep. Maybe some of us in this chamber can still remember our own sense of vulnerability yep. when we first went to university, probably the first time that we had stayed away from home on an extended basis. And the other thing is, and I would be astonished if someone disagrees with this, Scotland's universities take their duty of care for their students very seriously. And to, to the uniqueness of purpose-built student accommodation should be recognised by the Minister in the context of the amendment that I'm proposing. If members think that universities don't move heaven and earth to protect their students, I would suggest that members spend some time with Scottish universities. Uh, there are members here who have had their entire political ambition shaped by their experience at university. Um, and this is an occasion, I hope I can say this with a recognisable authenticity, for us to put down our megaphones and to 
rationally consider what this amendment does in terms of protecting students. The behaviours covered by the briefing that University of Scotland has provided goes beyond the criminal antisocial behaviour that is mentioned in the Bill. I am also pretty sure that all of us as Members of Parliament will have had the experience of dealing with cases where constituents have felt threatened by someone whose actions are not criminal but nevertheless pose a risk to others. And this amendment is about risk and protection. And the univers universities in Scotland need to have the freedom to be able to evict people who are posing a risk to others. This happens now and is handled discreetly and with great care by university accommodation managers up and down the country. It's subtle and it allows professional housing managers to take action to prevent problems before there is a criminal accusation, a criminal charge and a criminal conviction. This is sensible management. This is a sensible approach to often a very difficult and sensitive problem. What this bill does is remove the ability of those professionals to do their job in the interests of all of the students in their care. And my amendment would put a reasonable and controlled amount of responsibility into the hands of those who are closest to the issues that I'm describing that require sensitive management. Now, I am very firmly of the view that this legislation that uh, we're rushing through this parliament this week is going to be a disaster in terms of increasing homelessness, homelessness and in terms of choking off the supply of available property for accommodation for rent. But let's put that aside for a minute. Threats, neighbourhood disputes, disruption, drug taking, loud parties, abusive behaviour in our communities are a scourge. Yep. Yep. And they are responsible for so much misery. There is no need for that to be tolerated within the confines of purpose-built student accommodation. 700,000 of our fellow Scots report having been victims of antisocial behaviour in the past three years, according to the Community Safety Group Resolve. To protect the minority of perpetrators, the government seemed to be prepared, in the context of purpose-built student accommodation, the government seemed to be prepared to be content to leave the, majority, the lives of the majority students in halls miserable, because nothing can be done. So it's imperative convener that we allow, don't allow this to happen. Yeah. It is imperative that we trust the professionals. Yeah. It's imperative that we give them the power, the flexibility to run the institutions that they know best how to run, to protect the people that they know how best to protect. Yeah. So as I say, in discussing this amendment, it simply is a I think a common sense based proposal that allows universities to operate without this restrictive and disproportionate piece of legislation which will restrain them and leave our young people without adequate protection. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I now call Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 35 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Balfour. Uh, thank you, Convener. Convener, it will not surprise you that Mr. Harvey and I don't agree on many things politically. Um, but the one thing we do agree on, and I think everyone in this chamber agrees on, is that we want as many homes as possible available for people to live in, and we don't want empty homes uh, lying empty over a number of months. And at this point, uh, Camille, I probably should declare that I am um, a member of the Church of Scotland. My amendments 35 and 40 would give um, churches which uh, would give property tied to religious settings um, an exemption from this legislation. This is done purely on a pragmatic way. It was introduced uh, previously by my colleague uh, Myrtle Fraser, and I'm hoping maybe that the Scottish Government have time to reflect on this, because here is the practicality of where we are in Scotland today. There are many uh, religious organisations, churches in particular, 
that have empty property because we don't have a minister or someone else to lead uh, their particular denomination um, at this time. So take the example of the Church of Scotland. The Church of Scotland at the moment, I understand, um, have a fairly well blanket on no church being able to call a minister. That means if a church is vacant, it will remain vacant for the for foreseeable future. That is an empty property that could be let out to somebody within that community. But when that church is allowed to call a minister, it clearly needs that property back so that the minister can live there and then carry out his or her role within that community. And what this allows is for the, the church to let out its property, but when a minister is called, then that can then be go back to the church. That would seem to me allowing over this particular uh, winter period an opportunity for more homes to be used without the church never getting it back. And I would be interested if the minister, in, if he speaks within this section, could tell me why that is a bad thing at all. Uh, of Martin Fraser. I'm grateful to Mr. Raffer for giving way. He'll recall, as he, as he acknowledged, I raised these issues in relation to the previous uh, COVID uh, bill legislation, which addressed similar points. And at that point, I said the concern here was that there would be an unintended consequence that churches would just refuse to rent out empty manses, which would then lie uh, without anybody living in them. That is now happening as a consequence of that legislation. This is an opportunity to put that right and bring these properties back into use. And I hope the government will take it. Jeremy Balfour. Um, as always, I simply follow in the members' uh, footsteps, and absolutely, uh, he has got this right. And I say, as a former minister myself, that you do need somewhere to live when you're in that job. But as somebody who recognises there are empty homes at the moment, why not let them be let out? Why not help, particularly in areas where we need that housing? For similar, um, I would move on, Convener, to Amendments 36 and 54 in my name. Uh, this deals with um, another area which I think, again, would allow uh, individuals to release property, particularly over these winter months, and allow them to be used for local people. As uh, I'm sure we're all aware that there are seasonal workers who will come on to agricultural and rural businesses um, to tide housing, but we only need them in the spring and summer time. Often they will then lie empty over the winter period because we only need them back for the next season. We're stopping local people within local communities being able to benefit from that housing even on a short-term basis. And again, I, I, I would generally welcome to know why the Minister thinks we shouldn't be releasing these types of property onto the market, because why we're holding, well, the minister saying we're holding back, the reason we're holding back is we know from evidence, as Mr. Fraser said, that churches and other people within rural and agricultural areas are holding these properties back because they will need them at some point. Move away from dogma, be pragmatic, support these amendments. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, convener. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. I now call Mark Griffin to speak to uh, Amendment 37 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I have a, a series of amendments in groups four, five and six where I lodge them to probe with the government. I understand um, the Minister's ambition to make sure that this legislation is balanced in terms of the right of landlords and of the tenant, but um, amendments in these three groups just certainly probe as to whether the, the balance has gone slightly too far in favour of the, the landlord as opposed to the tenant. In particular, in the, this group, um, Amendments 37, 38, 41 and 42, um, these ensure that exceptions related to substantial arrears and financial hardship on the part of the landlord can only apply when a, a high test of financial hardship applies as a direct result of those substantial arrears. So the, the, the hardship reported must be as a result of the arrears experienced. And I, 
Secondly, I wanted to come on to um, the, the level of arrears. Now, a moratorium on evictions is what we are legislating for, and exceptions for substantial arrears provide, I feel, too wide an exemption for that moratorium. Uh, hence, these amendments remove that exception entirely. Now, regarding the, the social sector, Shelter advised that the average arrears for evicted tenants in 2019-20 was around £9,000. So, in context, the bill um, sets the threshold um, far too low, I feel, um, to be considered su substantial at a level of um, just over £2,000. Due to um, time constraints, um, what the substantial rent arrears definition uh, has been removed from the list of exemptions, but the detail still is retained in the bill and is my intention to come back at stage three, but ask members to support the amendments in my name in this group. Thank you, Mr Griffin. And I call Miles Briggs to speak to amendment 39 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Uh, th thank you, convener. Um, my amendment uh, 39 is in relation to landlords having the right to decant or evict uh, tenants in the case of essential work and demolition, which I think is something which uh, hasn't been discussed. Essential work, such as the removal of asbestos, can be dangerous to occupants. Therefore, we believe that landlords should be able to decant tenants from properties which are undergoing essential, essential maintenance. Furthermore, landlords should also be available able to evict tenants when buildings are to be demolished. Uh, demolition could occur because the property is too old and safe for occupants, and therefore um, we try to put this amendment forward uh, to look towards keeping tenants safe as well. My second amendment with regards to amendment 43 is in relation to landlords having the right to evict unlawful uh, occupants. An unlawful occupier is a person that lives in a property without the consent of the homeowner. This could include people that, that, that were not initially agreed upon when the lease was signed. Therefore, landlords should have the right to evict. A landlord is unable to charge uh, these occupants rent as they are not the tenant. Uh, so if the landlord is unable to evict, then due to the uh, moratorium, it would represent a significant financial loss. This ground is already used commonly to evict tenants who have ended their tenancy, uh, but where the tenant has not notified the landlord uh, and then not moved out. Um, so I hope uh, government will consider these um, in the light we've brought them forward um, as a workable amendments. Thank you, uh, Mr Briggs. And I call the minister. Thank you, Camina. Um I'd like to draw out Amendment 39, first of all, uh, which Miles Briggs spoke to a moment ago, uh, which exempts demolition of or substantial work on property within the social rented sector from the moratorium on evictions. Uh, we are keen to ensure that tenants are protected from eviction, but we recognise that being able to refurbish large accommodation uh, will help many tenants, uh, and we would expect tenants in these circumstances to be supported through that process, uh, including being provided with alternative accommodation. So, uh, Amendment 39 is one that we intend to support, uh, and I uh, thank Miles Briggs for bringing it and encourage Parliament to vote for it. In terms of some of the other amendments in this group, some are attempting to reduce the protection for tenants uh, by increasing the exemptions from the moratorium, and others uh, are attempting to remove some of the safeguards uh, that we believe are needed, uh, in particular around substantial rent arrears. And again, we come back to this theme which has come out of several of the, the groups around balance. We need a, a, a bill which achieves the level of protection that tenants need, but also has safeguards uh, within it. Uh, we believe uh, that the bill, as presented, uh, achieves that, and we uh, won't be supporting the other amendments in this group. Some of them uh, which seek to, to uh, increase the exemptions from the moratorium and therefore reduce the level of protection seem to be predicated on the idea that the government is holding properties back from rent. That is very clearly not the case. It would be possible, it would be possible uh, Kabina, for us to remove all tenants' rights and protections altogether, and this would work in the interests of those who want to become landlords but have complete flexibility working on their side. That would not be appropriate. Uh, all organisations uh, which seek to become landlords have to accept that tenants 
uh, who are moving into those properties, that becomes their home. And that home needs to be respected. Their rights and security at home need to be respected. I give way. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, um, except, and I accept it's not something he wants, but it's happening, is that people are holding back property yeah. which could be used. So I accept it's an unforeseen circumstance, yeah. but this has been shown that what's happened in the last few months, that people are not putting property on the market which could be used because they're not getting the, the, the fear that they won't get the property back. And it's not better to have somebody in a home, even for a short period of time, rather than having them homeless. Minister. Well, the problem of, of empty homes has been one that's existed for a long time and, and successive governments, not just this government, but previous governments, including uh, way back to, uh, to the days of the, the Labour Lib Dem administration, have continued to increase the effort that's being put into bringing empty homes uh, into use. There's always going to be work to do, and I'm sure there's more that we can do to create the right incentives for empty homes to be brought into use. But I don't think that should be achieved by reducing the protection of tenants uh, for whom those, those properties would become home. And in the case of uh, amendments uh, 37, 38, 41 and 42, which attempt to uh, remove or, or weaken some of the, the safeguards that are needed around substantial rent arrears, I recognise that the provisions on, on rent arrears uh, are one of the, the controversial areas. And as I said in the stage one debate, uh, I thought long and hard about how and whether we present these, uh, uh, these measures uh, as part of the package of safeguards. I believe that the support tenants facing rent arrears and substantial rent arrears really need is not necessarily the same uh, as the support in, in other areas. It is direct support, and that's coming through discretionary housing payments. That's coming through the Tenant Grant Fund. It's coming through the work that we're doing to raise awareness of tenants' rights and make sure that people are able to exercise uh, those rights. So I, I do think that these particular amendments would weaken the package of safeguards uh, to the point of, of not having uh, an, uh, a, a bill which strikes the appropriate balance. Uh, and I, I'll be coming on to Mr Kerr's amendment in a moment, but if he wants to give way, if he wants me to give way first. Okay. Uh, in, in relation to amendment 44, uh, yes, I'll, I'll give way. Bob Doris. Minister, forgive me. It was just on the the level reached at for rent arrears by which evictions could potentially still proceed. Can I just get some assurance that that won't undermine the other protections that exist for tenants through pre-action protocols and pre-action requirements and that cases we still have to appear in court and if the landlord was not seen as being reasonable, it would be thrown out by a court? Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. The, the measures on pre-action protocols, which uh, have been a requirement in the social rented sector for a long time, of course, and uh, earlier this year, Parliament agreed to make those permanent measures in relation to the private rented sector. Uh, that, that will not be bypassed uh, in any way. Uh, and indeed, if, uh, if a, 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 an eviction measure goes to the tribunal, the requirement uh, to take all circumstances into account uh, and, and the test of reasonableness uh, is still a very important. Uh, in relation to Amendment 44, if this was accepted, evictions could still go ahead as they do now negating the point of including college, uni university, halls of residence and purpose-built student accommodation within the moratorium. It also places a new duty uh, on the first-tier tribunal to consider whether a, tenant in a student tenancy has failed to comply with the tenancy agreement and determine whether it is reasonable. Not only would that have an impact on the workload and the costs uh, to, of the tribunal, but it would represent a new uh, type of tenancy agreement for them to consider. Mr Kerr uh, quite properly and quite rightly says that universities have a serious responsibility, uh, a, a duty of care, uh, and they do take that responsibility seriously, uh, including in situations where uh, one uh, student may pose a risk to others. But the, the, the moving to eviction, that is a very serious measure, and it does require a high bar uh, of evidence around that risk. And Mr Kerr's amendment gives me serious concern that any breach in the tenancy agreement, even a very minor breach in the tenancy agreement, could be used. If we accepted this amendment, uh, that the most minor breach could, uh, in theory, be used. And even though that test of reasonableness uh, would be applied if the case reached the tribunal, 
Students in that situation would not have the security of knowing that if they breached their tenancy in any very minor way, they would not have the security of knowing that they couldn't be evicted. I give way. Stephen Kerr. Um, thank you. If the Minister is concerned about the scope of this measure in relation to the way it's been written, then will he work with me in order to tighten it up so that the way that I've described it in my remarks to support the amendment, that that objective is satisfied? Um, would he be willing to work with me in order to achieve that? Because I think this is a worthwhile thing to work together on. Minister. Yeah, I would say that I'm, I'm not currently persuaded that the concerns that Mr Kerr outlines uh, are uh, you know, need, a, need a requirement to change the bill, but I'm content to have uh, my officials contact him and, and explore uh, what, uh, what other approaches might be uh, viable to, to meet his concerns. I, I don't believe that those concerns are validated at the moment in terms of the bill as we have it, but I'm perfectly content to have that, that discussion between uh, my office and, and his uh, before the amendment deadline for stage three. Stephen Kerr? Of course, would be happy to engage with his officials. But surely the Minister accepts that University of Scotland do know what they're talking about. And when they are focusing on this sort of an amendment, mm -hmm. then that does add weight to the importance of it. They are the ones that have been dealing and constantly dealing with these issues in purpose-built student accommodation. I hope you would accept that. Minister. Well, I think uh, it was Mr Fitzpatrick who may have uh, mentioned that the, the briefing came out before they had seen the text of the bill. Uh, as I say, I'm not persuaded at the moment that there is a serious issue here that requires an amendment to the bill, but I'm happy to have my office and Mr Kerr uh, communicate about that and explore uh, whether, uh, whether any change might be justified uh, before the, the Stage 3 amendment deadline. Having said that, uh, I would remind the Chamber that I uh, would urge members to support Amendment 39 uh, but will not be supporting the other amendments, uh, other amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. I call Murdo Fraser to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 33. Well, thank, thank you, President Officer. I didn't actually hear any comment from the Minister on Amendment 33, so I'm not entirely clear uh, if there's any particular reason why the Government is not supporting it. If Mr Harvey would like to intervene on me, I'm happy to take an intervention. Minister? Uh, I'm happy to interven intervene. My, my general comment that some of the amendments were seeking to weaken or undermine the protections against evictions uh, are, are uh, you know, not amendments that we would support. Other amendments are seeking to undermine the safeguards, and we don't support those either. Well, Mr. Fraser? Frankly, he doesn't seem to understand his own bill, presiding officer, because my amendment does none of these things. It simply seeks to clarify on the face of the bill that the eviction ban will not apply to notices served before the 6th of September 2022. It's very clear from the policy memorandum that that is in line with the government's stated intent. I'm really surprised the minister is claiming it means something else entirely. I'm totally confused by that. So I will press uh, that particular amendment, uh, presiding officer. I would, just, uh, I would just say briefly in relation to other matters, I welcome the fact that the government will support my colleague Miles Briggs's Amendment 39. In relation to Amendment 35, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, I think Mr Balfour made a very strong case there. Uh, like Mr Balfour, I'm a member of the Church of Scotland. Uh, I'm aware that there are Church of Scotland properties currently lying empty that are not being offered up for rent and will not be offered up for rent because of the concern that the Church has. If they offer them for rent, they will not be able to resume possession uh, should they be required for the purposes of hosting a minister or a pastoral worker. The, the minister said, uh, in response to Mr Balfour, that properties are not being held back. That is simply not true. The minister hasn't done his homework. He hasn't engaged with stakeholders. He hasn't listened to those who have an interest in this particular field. If he had, he would know he is talking balderdash in this chamber. It is not true. It is not true that properties are not being held back. All he has to do is pick up the phone to the Church of Scotland or any other church, and he will hear the truth. He needs to start doing the work as a minister and stop being so lazy, presiding officer. Shocking. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, hello. Uh, could we not have uh, sedentary conversations across the chamber, please? Um, the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed, and therefore we'll move to a division.
The vote is now closed. Uh, members, could I call you all to order, please? That includes every member in the chamber. Uh, the result of the vote on amendment number 33 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes, 31, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 34 in the name of Stephen Kerr, already debated with amendment 33. Stephen Kerr, to move or not move? I moved. The question is uh, that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are not agreed and there will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 34 in the name of Stephen Kerr is yes, 29, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 35 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 33. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, move, Commissioner. The question is that amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Uh, the vote is now closed. Point of order, Ros McCall. Yeah, my apologies. My vote didn't go through. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms McCall. That will be recorded.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 35 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes, 29, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 36 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 33. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 36 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes, 28, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 33. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 37 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 19, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 38 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 33. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 33. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, this might represent the most important part of uh, my work this week, <laughs> uh, Convener, so yes, moved. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call uh, Amendment 40 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 33. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, Kempton, but uh, no, convener. I, I'm sorry, Mr Balfour, could you clarify? That's no, moved. not moving. No. Not moving. Not sorry. N -O -T. Not Thank you. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 33. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 42 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 33. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 33. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division.
The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 43 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 29, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Stephen Kerr, already debated with Amendment 33. Stephen Kerr to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 44 in the name of Stephen Kerr is yes, 29, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move on to the next group, which is uh, Safeguards for Landlords' Financial Hardship. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 45 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Ms McNeill. Thank you very much. I speak to Amendments 45, 50, 56, 58, 65 and 66 in my name, and all related, the right to apply for a wrongful termination order. So these amendments seek to flag that a tenant can apply for a wrongful termination order if a landlord fails to take up the occupancy of the property. So if you look at the bill as drafted, if you look at the first section, it deals with landlords intend to sell the property. But I'm dealing with the second half of that, so paragraph four, it is an eviction ground that a landlord intends to live in the property to alleviate financial hardship, is suffering hardship, intends to alleviate that hardship by occupying the let property as a landlord's only or principal home. Nothing uh, wrong with that. Um, I have had many cases under current housing law in which there are 17 grounds for eviction, and I have seen many cases where the landlord says, you are being evicted because I intend, or my family intends to move into that property. Now, I appreciate that this provision is narrower than, than that. Um, however, I, I want to seek to probe this question um, because uh, there's nothing here which provides that there's any evidence that the landlord has moved into the property. Now, can I say, for the purposes of probing this, I've come up with a suggestion, um, which could be three months of council tax, which you would expect to pay if you're actually living in, in the property. Um, I think it's important when we're dealing, especially because it's emergency legislation, it's quite rushed, to make sure that we haven't left any loopholes in relation to this, although you may think these cases are few and far between, uh, and it may be that you, can't, you, you think you can't resolve it because the tenant is already evicted. Uh, but I would say that these amendments seek to discourage landlords who decide to use financial hardship for the grounds for eviction to say that they need to move into the property they're renting out to evict a tenant, but subsequently do not move into that property, and a new tenant uh, moves in. As I say, I say on the basis of constituency cases, which I dealt with at the beginning of the pandemic, where there were many people who uh, had to move out of the property just simply because of a statement made by the landlord, I'd like this property, thank you very much. All I'm seeking to do is to flush out any landlords who may seek to do that, and I realise it might be a tiny minority, but if we're doing this legislation properly, I'd like to probe that issue. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms McNeill. I call Mark Griffin uh, to speak to Amendment 46 and other amendments in the group. Mr Griffin. Thank you, Camina. This group, again, continues on the theme that I feel in the government trying to strike a balance between landlords and tenants so as to not face challenge that they have perhaps gone a bit too far um, in the, the balancing of rights toward the landlord rather um, than the tenants. These amendments in my name uh, in this group say that a tenant should not lose their home because a landlord intends to sell or live in the property if they have no cause in the financial hardship of the landlord. It does not seem um, fair to me that a, a tenant should be forced out of a, a home through no fault of, of their own. And that would mean that the exception can only be used we are keeping a tenant who had been building up in um, arrears in the house until the, the, if they continue to build arrears up until the end of the eviction ban would then cause the landlord significant financial hardship that that should be allowed. So in saying that, um, it would only be fair that um, that exception could be applied if the hardship was caused directly by the tenant themselves. Also, as an additional burden on the landlord, the uh, amendment set out that they uh, must provide the tribunal with an affidavit of their intention to sell or live in the property, as well as evidence of their undertakings to sell and the confirmation from a financial or money advisor or chartered accountant. I again, feel that perhaps um, we have gone too far in terms of the balance between landlord and tenant, and these amendments try and pull that back more in favour of the tenant. Thank you, Kimura. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call the Minister. Thank you, convener. I, uh, I can only accept one amendment in this group, but there are a number of other amendments in the group where I am sympathetic to the intention, but can't and um, would uh, offer the opportunity to, to work with colleagues. Uh, I will address them in terms Amendment 45, I can confirm that the existing protections against wrongful termination will apply to the emergency measures, uh, and given that, I do not believe that this amendment is required. Amendment 46 seeks to link the definition of financial hardship to substantial rent arrears, uh, and Mark Griffin sets out some of the, the reasons why he thinks that is justified. It is clear, though, that uh, financial hardship can arise as a result of uh, other factors that are also out with the landlord's control. And so, in order to strike that balance, uh, we believe that we uh, have to recognise that uh, a, a landlord who may have lost their job or a, a separate business has failed and they have uh, ended up with, with debts that are unmanageable may need to take action, uh, not because of factors within their control, also not within uh, factors within the tenant's control, uh, but that they, uh, they have the, uh, the, the prospect of financial hardship, and the only option that they may have uh, is to sell or move into a property. So we believe that in order to meet the test of proportionality uh, and balance, uh, we, we believe that we have that right, and we do not think it would be appropriate to link the definition of hardship to the rent arrears. Uh, amendments 47, 49, 55 and 64 uh, all seek to require landlords who are seeking an eviction on the basis of one of these new grounds of financial hardship to provide specific types of information to the tribunal to evidence their hardship. Landlords uh, must evidence this hardship, but the information that is required will depend on the circumstances of each case, and the tribunal is best placed to determine what specific information that they see as necessary to determine whether the landlord is in financial hardship. I do not think it is appropriate, therefore, for us to mandate the specific information outlined by the amendment. But there are, of course, uh, good examples in the amendment of the information that the tribunal may wish to request. So while I cannot support this amendment today, I have spoken to the member uh, and I hope to be able to be in a position to support amendments addressing this at stage three. I am uh, pleased to support Amendment 48, uh, as this uh, includes an affidavit from landlords that they intend to live in the let property as examples of the evidence that could be provided to the tribunal as part of an eviction case. Uh, amendments 
50, 36 and 65 all seek to require landlords to provide three months' worth of council tax statements to evidence uh, that they have moved into the property that has been repossessed. Uh, these two uh, seek to address, address an area that I am also concerned about. However, the Tribunal does not have a role in ensuring that a landlord has moved into the property except where a tenant makes a wrongful termination application. It is therefore not appropriate to require landlords to provide this information to the Tribunal, and I cannot accept these amendments. Amendments 53, 57, 62 and 63 all seek to require the First Tier Tribunal to consider whether the tenant has been informed about all the support uh, before being granted a, a uh, before being granted an, an application for eviction. I agree that this uh, is vital support for tenants, but the pre-action protocols for rent arrears that we made a, requirement, a, a permanent requirement during the COVID recovery bill already ensure that landlords are required to do this. And the extent to which the landlord has complied will be taken into account by the tribunal when they determine whether it is reasonable to grant an eviction. I therefore do not support this amendment. Amendment 58 aims to ensure that a wrongful termination in relation uh, to where a landlord fails to live in the let property would be considered an unlawful eviction. Unlawful eviction requirements provide protection for, a te for a tenants where a landlord has not used the correct legal <coughs> excuse me, where a landlord has not used the co correct legal processes to end a tenancy. However, wrongful termination applies where they have used the correct legal process but have misled the tenant and the tribunal into ordering an eviction. I do not believe it is appropriate to combine these two separate processes. Amendment 66 creates an offence where a landlord repossesses a property uh, under the 1984 Act, but then fails to move into the property. And again, while I am sympathetic to the intention behind the amendment, it would not be appropriate to create a new criminal offence through temporary legislation. Uh, in addition, there are existing protections, uh, both criminal and civil, for these circumstances, uh, and so I, I can't support this amendment. Uh, and amendment 67 uh, again links substantial rent arrears to financial hardship, and as I said, in relation to amendment 46, uh, this uh, would substantially reduce the safeguards uh, that are part of the balanced package we're presenting today, and I therefore can't support that amendment. So, uh, in summary, convener, I do support Amendment 48, but not the others in this group. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Pauline McNeill uh, to wind up, please, and to press or withdraw Amendment 45. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I had wanted to intervene in the Minister. You may have heard me in relation to his statement that uh, in relation to Amendment 45, that there are existing, the existing protections will apply, but he didn't say what they were. Um, I'm not clear what those protections are, because I don't think I'm the only member who's had cases where the landlord, so, provided, so the landlord had to provide that hardship test. I'm not talking about the hardship test. What I'm talking about is the statement that the landlord then requires it to live in the property. It will never be tested. And I don't really understand, in a layperson's terms, what the difference is between wrongful termination and an unlawful conviction. Because if you, you, if you wrongly terminate the contract because you, because you see you're going to move into the property and you don't do it, surely that must be unlawful. And um, it's something at which, actually, it was Andy Whiteman who brought to the chamber in the last discussion we had about evictions during the coronavirus. Um, there, is, there are 17 grounds, and it is relatively easy, provided in this legislation you, you pass the hardship test to say you're moving into the property, and you don't. Um, so I have to express a bit of disappointment that that point is not taken on board by ministers. I would probably have guessed that what you would say about the remainder of the amendments. I openly said I'm not suggesting that my amendments are the best way forward in order for the landlord to prove. But I stand by what I'm saying today, and that is that as the law stands, it's quite easy for landlords passing the first test to say they're moving into property, and no one will ever check if they've done that, and that, unfortunately, the poor tenant is already out the property. 
I don't know if you want to come back, Minister, on that. Minister? I, I, I don't disagree for a moment, and I, I hope my, uh, my remarks uh, recognise the sub substance of the, the issues that, um, that Polly McNeill is raising. I don't disagree for a moment that there are substantial issues here. I, th I suspect that these are best addressed in the longer-term review of the repossession grounds, which the Government is already committed to in terms of making permanent change to the law. I don't think it's best addressed through these temporary measures uh, in relation to emergency legislation. I'd be very happy to make sure that officials uh, get in touch uh, after we've finished with this legislation with Pauline McNeill and other colleagues to make sure that our longer-term work is well informed by the, the concerns that she raises. And like other members, I recognise some of these issues through my uh, local post bag as well. Uh, and I, I suspect that there are the, there's great scope for working together on some of that longer term work on this, but I, I don't think the emergency legislation is the right place for it. Polly McNeill. I thank the Minister for that answer, and uh, I accept that there are wider reforms needed, but I do want to get the substantive point on the agenda now, albeit for. So I'm going to push Amendment 45 for that reason, um, but I, Presiding Officer, indicate I will not be moving the other amendments when you come to ask me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms McNeill. The question is, does Amendment 45 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 45 in the name of Polly McNeill is yes, 21, no, 90. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 46 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 19, no, 96. The, the, there were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. 
I call Amendment 47 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Uh, in light of the Minister's comments, not moved. Not moved. Uh, I now call Amendment 48 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. We're not all agreed. Beg your pardon. Uh, and therefore, there will be a division. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 48 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 85, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 49 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 50 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 45. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. We will now move on to the next group, which is uh, Safeguards for Landlords' Substantial Rent Arrears. I call amendment number 51 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Mark Griffin to move amendment 51 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Griffin. Thank you, Premier. This is the, the third grouping where, again, I have lodged uh, amendments to attempt to uh, rebalance rights um, more in favour of the tenant um, than the landlord. Um, the, the first example of this is the um, amendments, Amendment 53 and, and others that are similar to state that a, a landlord must show that they have um, taken all steps to ensure that the tenant is informed about all support available, including that the tenant has exhausted the applications for any local authority financial support to which the tenant is entitled. I feel that is a, a, a sensible measure that um, before um, the substantial rent arrears ground would be um, granted that a landlord um, has done all they can to point their tent um, towards the, the support packages that, that are out there to alleviate the, the burden of those arrears, both on uh, tenant debt and also um, a landlord. And, uh, again, I think that the hardship test should also be linked to the result of the arrears um, as a result of arrears from that particular um, property. So, again, do not feel it is fair for a tenant to um, be evicted as a result of um, financial forces elsewhere, and that a, a landlord should have to prove that the hardship they experience is a direct result from the arrears built up through that tenancy. Um, and ask members to support all amendments in this group in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 52 and other amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, Deputy Convener. Um, before I speak on Amendments 52, 61 and 68, I'd like to correct an error I made earlier this afternoon by chiding the Minister for not understanding that a PRT was not for a fixed term. It is actually for an undefined period. That was actually in result to a comment that Ms McNeill made. I thought it was made by the Minister. The Minister, however, did not correct her, which gives me some concern. But accept my apologies for... for no, it is a substantial point. And, and when you're wrong, I always think it's worth admitting it. So I, the amendments that I... 
presiding officer. Uh... I, I'm not sorry. Sorry, is somebody trying to make a point of order? No, I, Mr. Mountain, would you like to continue? Sorry, presiding officer, I couldn't hear what, what was being said. I want to speak to Amendment 52, 61, and 68, and these relate to the period of time where substantial rent arrears could occur. Currently in the legislation it is six months, I'm suggesting it is three months. Now I'd like to make clear why I'm doing this. First of all, there seems to have been a conception peddled that all landlords are bad landlords. That, that is not the case. Most landlords are struggling to let their properties and want to do it at a fair rate. And you should bear... Yes, of course, Minister. Um, Minister. I'm grateful to the member for, for giving way. I wonder if he could just point to who it is during any of our debates uh, or scrutiny on this bill who has said what he's just accused people of saying, and will he recognise that the government's position consistently is to recognise that not all landlords are in the same financial circumstances and that it's a minority of landlords who behave in abusive or exploitative ways? Edward Mountain. And I, and I thank the Minister for that helpful clarification of the Government's position, and, and it dispels some of the comments that have been made by other people, and I would say not him or the Government. Now, what, what I would like to say is that landlords struggle to keep their properties let, and the reason for doing that is they want continuation of a tenancy, because every time a tenant moves out of the property, there are costs incurred. For example, carrying out an inventory, PAT testing, gas testing, to name but a few, advertising the property, and those costs could be in excess of £800 per property. Now, that's an interesting figure, because that figure relates and correlates to the figure that is in the financial uh, memorandum with this bill, which says that the average rent for properties in Scotland is about £780, in the region of £780. Now, that's an interesting figure as well, because if you take that as a figure and say that a rent arrears for three months would equate to over £2,000, and rent, month, rent arrears for over four months would be £4,000. If you then allow those rent arrears to build up, you are building up a problem for the tenant, because they will have to repay that. And, and my concern is that the longer that takes to come to a, a definition or a conclusion, the tenant's bills could be, he could be struggling or he or she could be struggling further. So, therefore, addressing the problem at the three months actually might not be a, a silly thing to do. It gives a chance to, for the tenant and the landlord to get together to try and find a solution. Because the problem with going with a first-tier tribunal, evidence that's been given to me today suggests that it is six to nine months in Glasgow, could mean that by the, pro by the time that, if it is six months, as proposed under this legislation, it could be 15 months before the problem is resolved. Now, if you repay the rent arrears at £50 a month, which seems to be a reasonable period, that means that the tenant could be paying those 15, uh, £50 per month for over 15 years. That's an incredibly long period of time, and that causes me concern. I also would suggest that the longer the tenant is in arrears, the more difficult it is for the landlord to make the improvements. And I've made this argument earlier during the course of this debate. We all have an obligation to ensure that properties are properly insulated and costs are kept down. To give the Minister an idea, I'm sure he knows these figures, replacing a boiler is probably about £4,000 on an average house. Double glazing could be in the region of a normal house of six to £7,000. And insulation just for the house alone, without including the floor, could, by the time you've redecorated, be in the region of £15,000. So every time the landlord loses money, we are delaying the point to net zero. Now, I would also say, uh, I've made the point, I think, uh, about uh, landlords working with tenants. There's been no mention or no acknowledgement of the important part that the landlord registration plays at local government level. So landlords that don't measure up, landlords that are not good landlords, can be removed off the landlord register, which means they're not available to rent, rent their property. Amendment 70 um, was, was done in a bit of a rush because this emergency legislation, and I think it could be improved. And I asked the minister if he would consider, uh, or his officials would consider with me, looking at Amendment 70 uh, 
to allow me to include the word in there available to tenants and landlords so that both sides knows what the uh, advice they need to consider when the value of rent that is in arrears have reached excessive levels. I think that would be helpful for both parties. And if the minister would be minded to consider that, then I would be happy to withdraw Amendment 70 at this stage and resubmit it at stage three. Um, I'm happy to hear other arguments on the amendments that I've put forward, uh, presiding officer. Thank you. I call the minister. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, amendments, uh, I have to uh, preface this, uh, I, I'm afraid I won't be accepting any of the amendments in this group and if the, the members move them to the vote then I will, I will have to ask Parliament to vote against them. Uh, amendments uh, 51 and 60 seek to make the eviction ground for substantial rent arrears subject to the eviction ground of the, the landlord intending to live in the property to alleviate financial hardship. Uh, this appears to provide that a landlord could only evict for substantial rent arrears if they also intended to live in the property. Uh, and given that intends to live uh, ground is a standalone provision already, which can uh, provide the, the basis for evictions anyway, this, uh, the effect of this amendment is uh, to make the, the ground for eviction for substantial rent arrears redundant in most cases and only applicable in cases where the landlord intends to occupy the property. Uh, this would significantly reduce uh, the impact of the safeguard, the package of safeguards which we have said uh, is balanced in terms of respecting and, and uh, recognising the rights and interests of tenants as well as landlords. Uh, this uh, amendment would, would interfere with that balance uh, and I think it would, it would interfere with it in a, a way that would uh, give rise to significant uh, risk of, of challenge. Amendments 53, 57 and 63 seek to place an obligation on uh, presumably the landlord to ensure that the tenant is informed about all support available, including that the tenant has exhausted applications for any local authority financial support to which the tenant is entitled. I am sure it is not intended to, to do this, but we believe uh, that it would inappropriately uh, require the landlord to make inquiries, uh, potentially of an intrusive nature, into the financial affairs of a tenant, and many tenants may not want to share that information with their landlord. Um, the tribunal, of course, already has discretion to explore whether the tenant has attempted to seek support, uh, and indeed, uh, if uh, in, in circumstances where a pre-action protocol is required, uh, whether that has been complied with. So we believe that um, the intention of these uh, amendments is not necessary, and we would urge the member not to move them. And uh, Amendments 59 and 69 uh, seek to tie the link uh, between the landlord's financial hardship uh, as, with, uh, the, 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 um, uh, as part of the, the landlord's intention to live in the let property with the tenant being in substantial rent arrears. Uh, these grounds are separate because it is acknowledged that the cost of living crisis not only impacts on tenants but also impacts on landlords independently of whether their tenant is paying rent or not. If a landlord has lost their residence, for example, due to financial hardship, uh, we do think it's unreasonable uh, – sorry, we do think it's reasonable that they should be able uh, to occupy a rental property that's owned by them. And it's the tribunal in each individual case which would determine whether uh, eviction is reasonable in those circumstances. So again, I'm afraid I would ask uh, the member not to move those amendments and Parliament to vote against them if they are moved. Uh, as for amendments uh, 70 and I think 62 is consequential on, on 70, uh, we have uh, considered carefully what the uh, level of, uh, of um, uh, arrears should be, the, the appropriate level of arrears. We have concluded that six months worth of rent uh, is the appropriate level. Uh, a reduced threshold for triggering, triggering uh, this eviction ground might see tenants becoming at risk of eviction even after a relatively short uh, and temporary period of financial difficulty. Uh, we do not believe that this amendment should be supported. And I think it is worth reflecting that uh, some in this debate have argued uh, that a level of six months rent arrears uh, is setting the bar too low. Others have said, suggested it is setting the bar too high. And again, we come back to this issue of balance. We do need to uh, ensure that we have a balanced package 
We believe that that is what the Bill represents at the moment, and so I can't support the amendments in this group and would uh, urge members not to press them uh, and members to vote against them if they are pressed. Uh, if I am still able to give away. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. It, uh, particularly Amendment 70, I understand that you actually group 70 with uh, 52, 61 and 68. Amendment 70 is particularly different. It is about advice to tenants and landlords. And you have not covered that, Minister. I'm, I would be happy to withdraw it if you are, as I said, if, if you or your officials would work with me to allow advice to be developed for landlords and tenants. I think that would strengthen it, Minister. Minister. Uh, I, I uh, offer as a, a, a sincere an apology to the member as he offered to me earlier. I, I think I may have glanced over some of my speaking notes uh, about Amendment 70, uh, which seeks that the ministers make sure that advice is available uh, for landlords on how to recoup rent arrears. A landlord will be able to go through the usual eviction proceedings in cases where a tenant has not paid their rent and will also be able to pursue any existing remedies for recovery of arrears owed to them. Uh, and nothing in the bill impacts on the existing processes for landlords' recovery of rent. Thank you. And I call Mark Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 51. Thanks, Convener. Just thank um, members for engaging in the debate. Thank the Minister for his comments and, and response and seek permission to withdraw Amendment 51. Thank you. Mr Griffin seeks to withdraw Amendment 51. Does any member object? No member objects, and Amendment 51 is withdrawn. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 51. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved, uh, Camino. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Um, the committee is not agreed. We will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 52 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 27, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 53 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 54 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 33. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move, Convener. Thank you. I call Amendment 55 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 56 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 45. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. 
Thank you. I call Amendment 57 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 58 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 45. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 59 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 60 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 61 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 51. Edward Mountain to move or not, not move? moved? Thank you. I call Amendment 62 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 63 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 64 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 45. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 45. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 45. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 51. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 51. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 51. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Um, I'm not moving it. Uh, I look, look for an amendment at stage three. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We now move on to the group entitled Duty to Provide Information and Advice. I call Amendment 71 in the name of Paul Sweeney, grouped with Amendment 73. Paul Sweeney to move Amendment 71 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to move Amendment 71 in my name. and uh, I support um, the principle of this legislation and I hope that this amendment will be received by the government in the spirit is intended to be constructive and non-contentious. I welcome the fact that the government have brought this legislation forward and although I do think it could and should have been done sooner, it should go further and ultimately it should do more to address the fundamental imbalance of power that exists between tenants and their landlords. However, in the absence of increased protection and considering what the Minister has said regarding legal challenge, I do think we should now be looking at how we communicate and inform those affected by the legislation of their rights under this legislation and where they can receive advice and support during the period that the legislation is in force. The Scottish Government's programme for government admirably set out intentions of increasing the rights and protections available to tenants. It committed to a tenants' rights campaign that would showcase existing rights and ensure that tenants are aware of their ability to challenge rent rises. While that is admirable, the requirement for it becomes even greater with the increased rights contained in this bill. As such, I believe it makes sense to include an obligation on the government to take steps to ensure that the new provisions contained in this bill, when it is enacted, are communicated clearly and concisely to those impacted by its provisions. It is a minor adjustment to the legislation, but one that, I will, that will guarantee all tenants are aware of their rights and that all tenants can easily access information and advice and that all tenants know where to access support if they need to do so. Research from Rent Better, conducted in May of this year, found that tenants in Scotland have low awareness of their rights. Against the backdrop of a cost of living crisis and in the wake of new tenant protections coming to force with the introduction of this bill, it is vitally important that we do everything in our power to ensure that tenants are well informed when it comes to their rights. And by doing so, we may not fully redress the balance of power that exists between tenants and landlords, but we will at the very least begin to enable tenants to exercise their rights. 
So I would encourage the government to take this amendment in the spirit in which it is intended to add to and complement what is already there, not to distract from it. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 73 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, speak to ask member to support the amendment in my name, number 73, but also the amendment 71 in my uh, colleague's name. Um, amendment 73 places a duty on the Scottish Government compelling them to write to tenants and landlords giving advice and information on the rent freeze and eviction bans. Um, I raised this at stage one yesterday and was pleased to get support for that principle uh, across the Chamber. And as I indicated in the debate yesterday, communication about the cap, the moratorium and the rights to enforce protection uh, is key. In May, Rent Better reported that there is a lack of confidence and, and actually most would say fear amongst residents um, tenants exercising their rights due to a, per, a perceived potential repercussion of rent increases or perhaps even losing their home. The, the duty would come into force as part one does and a registered landlord is defined as those on the landlord register as there is likely no register of tenants. Um, ministers should write to those properties addressed to the, the, addressed to the tenant recorded on the, the register. Uh, I hope that would give um, tenants the information that they need to confidently challenge any landlord who would decide to um, act illegally and just hope that their tenants were, were misinformed and simply paid a, a higher rent and ask the, the members of the Chamber to support Amendment 71 and 73. Thank you. I call the Minister. Thanks, uh, Convener. Um, we are happy to support Amendment 71, um, but we can't support Amendment 73. Amendment 71 would require Scottish Ministers to take steps to ensure that tenants affected by the rent cap and the evictions moratorium receive appropriate information, advice and support. We are, of course, committed to taking those steps and already have plans in place, including through our cost of living campaign to raise awareness of tenants' rights and the support available to them, and are happy to accept that in the Bill. Um, amendment 73 would require that Scottish Ministers write to all registered landlords and residential addresses on the landlord register. It is, of course, uh, important that landlords and tenants are fully aware of their responsibilities and their rights. We will therefore work with local authorities to ensure all registered landlords are informed about the emergency measures and support available to their tenants. It is vital that tenants have the right information too. Uh, however, we know that a blanket approach uh, would not be the best or most cost-efficient way to contact tenants and landlords, and that is uh, why we will not support it. We will, though, employ a full range of communication channels to ensure a broad and effective reach of our messages. So I would urge members to support uh, Amendment 71, but not to support Amendment 73. Thank you. I call Paul Sweeney to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 71. I rise just to thank the Government for the constructive way in which they have engaged with my proposed amendment um, and to move it um, to a vote. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 72 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 8. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 73 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 71. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment. Oh, my apologies. We move on to the group entitled Expiry Suspension of Provisions. I call amendment 74 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And can I point out that either, if either amendment 77 or amendment 78 are agreed to, I can't call amendment 79 due to preemption. Mark Griffin to move Amendment 74 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Kibira. I, I move Amendment 74 and ask 
members to support the other amendments in this group in my name. Um, amendments 74, 75, 76 ensure that an eviction ban is in place from October 2023 to March 2024, regardless of whether the remainder of the provisions of the Bill have been extended. Um, all exceptions already in the Bill, for example, concerning antisocial behaviour, um, criminal behaviour, abandonment, abandonment would uh, apply. These amendments relate to the whole of Schedule 2 and provide that if the schedule is suspended, it must be revived over winter. The amendments expire the provision on the 31st of March 2024, so that it is not subject to the expiry date in the Bill or any earlier one that could be provided for in regulations. The, the Government's A New Deal for Tenants consultation found that a substantial majority 90 per cent of those answering the question thought that additional protections against the ending of tenancies during the winter period are needed. The intention here is to ensure that winter eviction ban is in place. It is in place for this winter and then continues for next winter ahead of the new housing bill becoming law. And I ask members to support uh, Amendment 74, 75, 76. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, my amendment number 77 looks to uh, put in place um, a point at which um, this legislation would expire. The First Minister has stated uh, that such interventions into the housing market must be time limited. Um, this is emergency legislation and we believe that it must has an, have an end date. Um, we therefore, in terms of this bill, note that ministers are already signalling two potential extensions, which would make this at least 18 months that this legislation will sit on the statute book. Examples from other countries, such as Sweden and Ireland, have indicated that prolonged controls on rents can lead to significant housing shortages, which in turn hurt potential tenants and homeless people trying to access tenancies, especially private tenancies. We therefore, hope members will support my uh, Amendment 77, to actually put in place an expir expiry date for this legislation. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 78 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Camina. Camina, one of the advantages of modern technology is that constituents can contact you as the debate goes on. Um, I received this uh, email uh, a few moments ago from one of my constituents here in Edinburgh. I have four HMO properties house and 21 tenants. If this legislation is passed tomorrow, I will need to sell up now. No option, and unfortunately, these youngsters will have to be evicted. That is the consequence yep. of this legislation that this government is forcing through. And when this, these 21 people come to Mr McPherson's surgery asking, where can I live? I hope he can look them in the eye and say, you could have had a safe house if I hadn't voted for this legislation. That's what you're doing today, Mr McPherson. Convener, I want to move uh, Amendment 78 and 82 in my name. 82 was, in fact, inspired um, by my uh, good friends Bob Dollis and John Mason in their speeches uh, yesterday afternoon in the Chamber. We have been told, um, again, that this is emergency legislation, that's why it can't be scrutinised. That's why it has to be rushed through in three sittings of this Parliament. If that is right, then we should have no further extensions should be allowed. We should come back and review it in an appropriate way. If this bill is, if this bill is truly designed as an emergency power with short-term measures, then all future extensions should not be allowed and instead we should, the government should bring forward new primary legislation which can be fully scrutinised mm -hmm. by the whole of this parliament. What this government is suggesting is that if they want to extend this, and I think they've already pretty well clearly said they do, that it will be done by regulation. And as everyone knows within this chamber, regulations cannot be amended. They can simply be voted for or against. It gives Parliament no scrutiny to make changes to anything that they would look at, which means you either take it all or you leave it all. That to me does not seem appropriate 
And that is why I brought forward Amendment 78. None of us know what the situation is going to be like in six months. None of us know how this legislation will work. We can guess that more people are going to be homeless, because we're hearing that already from people writing in. But we don't know that. We don't know what the economic situation is going to be, what we should be doing, if it is required. Bring forward, forward legislation. Don't just take a power grab to yourselves. I move both amendments in my name, Karina. Thank you. Call Willie Rennie to speak to Amendment 79 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, even though I'm still crushed by Bob Joris's rejection of my earlier amendments, I'm back for another attempt to give him another chance to redeem himself. Um, I will speak to Amendment 79, which seeks to remove the social sector from the power to extend post-March next year. Earlier, I sought to remove the social housing sector from the scope of the bill altogether, but now I seek a more modest attempt to limit it um, to March uh, next year. Housing associations set their rents once per year in conjunction with tenants, with the majority seeing any changes to rent take effect from April the 1st each year. Removing the ability to extend the term of the cap would give housing associations and councils the certainty they need to plan for the year ahead and engage as they normally would do with tenants and re rent levels and service levels as well. And the ability to extend the cap and remove housing associations and councils' control over their income would also damage investor confidence in the social housing sector in Scotland. Now, the indications from the Minister through today and yesterday have been that the social housing sector could be decoupled post-March. That's a good sign. Uh, all my amendment seeks to do is to confirm that now rather than waiting until later. So I'd urge members to vote for Amendment 79 to remove the uncertainty now, which will give benefits to councils, to housing associations and also their tenants. Thank you. I call the Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, uh, I promise the Chamber uh, there is nothing deliberate in the fact that the Cabinet Secretary chose to uh, lead on the group where we are being magnanimous, and I am <laughs> once again having to be here uh, asking uh, Parliament to vote against the amendments uh, in a group. Uh, but amendments uh, 74 and 75 in this group would require the moratorium on evictions to be in place over next winter, regardless of whether ministers consider them to be necessary and proportionate at the time. And if they've been expired before then, they would have to be revived. As we've stated on a number of occasions, this emergency legislation needs to be justified in terms of its necessity and its proportionality uh, in relation to the, the context that we're living in. Uh, and I, I'm afraid that this, uh, these amendments would uh, undermine that. This would be a dilution of the ongoing requirements that we built into this bill in recognition of the fact that emergency legislation is a serious step for government and parliament to take. Uh, the ongoing requirements which will allow them to be extended for two six-month periods where we consider them, uh, the provisions to be remaining necessary and proportionate. That's an important safeguard and I don't think it would be appropriate to have it set aside. Uh, amendment 76 supports amendments 74 and 75, so I can't support that either. Amendment 77 would remove Scottish ministers' power to extend the provisions for those two subsequent periods of six months altogether. And Amendment 78 also removes the Scottish ministers' power to extend uh, the provisions for two subsequent periods of six months. And instead, any uh, extension uh, under Amendment 78 would have to be done through a further primary act of the Scottish Parliament. We consider that being able to have these measures in place for a potential period of 18 months is fundamental to the protection for tenants that we're proposing in this bill. And so I can't support Amendments 77 or 78. Uh, Mr Balfour uh, says that it would be appropriate to come back and review these measures in an appropriate way. And that is precisely what is already built into the bill, just as it was for uh, previous emergency legislation. Very clear provisions uh, on review periods uh, and a requirement for Parliament uh, to be consulted if any future decisions on extension or expiry uh, are, uh, are proposed. Amendment 79 
uh, would prevent the power to extend the expiry of the bill as regards Scottish secure tenancies and Scottish short secure tenancies. As I set out, tenants in the social rented sector are some of the most vulnerable to the cost crisis in our society, and we do require to be able to extend the provisions, if necessary, uh, to those tenants beyond 31 March, if that is needed. I want to re-emphasise here, as I have repeatedly, the confidence that we have from the conversations we have already been undertaking with the social rented sector, that we can work collaboratively uh, with the sector, uh, and that may be an alternative to an extension uh, after the end of March. But this amendment, but this amendment would preempt uh, that work that we need to, to take forward with the sector. I give way to Mr Doris. Uh, oh, I thank Doris. the Minister for giving way. My, my good friend Willie Rennie was suggesting during his contribution that, that uh, if his amendment was, was, was passed, that would allow social landlords to go for statutory duty to consult on potential rent increases. He confirmed there is nothing to prevent them in this legislation get on with that consultation anyway. Minister. Uh, indeed, not only is there nothing to prevent them from consulting, uh, that consultation is a very fundamental and important part of the way uh, the social rented sector operates. And we encourage them not only to continue that, we also encourage tenants to participate uh, in those consultation processes, uh, which will uh, inform uh, the, the decisions around rent setting after the end of March. Mr Rennie uh, says that the uh, the, the zero per cent cap that is in place for the first six months could be decoupled. Not only could it be, it very clearly within the bill operates separately as a separate cap between the social and rented sector. So yes, it, it could well be uh, decoupled. But I can't commit now to uh, a guarantee uh, that it, it won't need to operate at any level at all uh, after the 31st of March. To do so would preempt and potentially even undermine the very positive and constructive dialogue that we're having between government and the social rented sector. Uh, finally, uh, convener, Amendment 82 would delete Section 6 entirely, meaning that the bill could not be extended beyond the 31st of March next year. And I think members will understand that, quite obviously, I cannot support that. So, once again, I urge members not to move the amendments in this group. If they are moved, I urge Parliament to reject them. Thank you. Mark Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 74. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate the Minister's comments on the um, introduction of a, a winter uh, moratorium on, on evictions going um, beyond the period where government would be assessing whether emergency legislation was, a, was appropriate or not. I do think they could take comfort from the fact that over 90 per cent of respondents to the consultation um, on a new deal for tenants said that they um, supported that measure. And I would be happy to seek permission to withdraw if I was given assurance by the Minister that it is a, um, a policy and a proposal that the Government would seek to take forward in that, that housing bill. Minister. The member is asking if we are continuing to commit to work collaboratively with colleagues on the longer term work that we have under the New Deal for Tenants. I can absolutely give that assurance. Uh, as I say, I do not think it is appropriate to make longer term permanent changes uh, within the emergency legislation. Okay. I, I, mean, I think I was looking for a more concrete commitment, not just to work um, constructively across all areas, which I do look forward to, but on that particular point on the the policy and principle of a, a, morat a winter moratorium on, on evictions. Um, but, President Officer, given the discussions that we will have, I look to continue the, the conversation the, and the discussion as other legislation um, progresses as well and seek permission to withdraw Amendment 74. Um, so, Mr Griffin is not moving Amendment 74. Um, I call Amendment 75 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 74. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 74. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 77 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 74. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. 
And I point out that if Amendment 77 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 79 due to a preemption. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The committee is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 77 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 28, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 78 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 74. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. Thank you. I point out that if amendment 78 is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 79 due to a preemption. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 78 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes 27, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Therefore, I call amendment 79 in the name of Willie Rennie, already debated with amendment 74. Willie Rennie, to move or not move? Based on the assurances provided by the Minister, I'm not going to move. Thank you. We move on to the group entitled Additional Information to be Provided by Scottish Ministers. I call Amendment 80 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. 
Mark Griffin to move Amendment 80 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 80 in my name. Amendment 80 is one drafted and, and lodged on the recommendation of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Um, Amendment 80 requires ministers, as part of their review processes, to assess the impact of an extension to Part 1 on the ongoing viability of the Tenant Grant Fund and the funding for the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. Oh, excuse me, um, just before I take your point of order, Mr Balfour, can I remind members that there is debate ongoing and be very grateful if all conversations could cease? Um, Mr Balfour? But my point of order, I mean, I couldn't hear Mr Griffin. <laughs> Thank you. Please continue, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I outlined yesterday the substantial concerns about the freeze on the social sector and their ability to continue their plans to build new affordable housing, which directly tackles Scotland's housing crisis, as well as maintaining and upgrading their existing properties. They have rang the alarm bells, and for one association in my region, even Hill Housing Association, that could means suspending all investment programmes well into 2024. Now, given that seven in ten social tenants receive housing benefit or universal credit, the majority of social tenants will not benefit from a freeze, but could potentially lose out on investment in their own homes, where rent is paid by the UK government. So then are the, the increases, and modelling from SPICE have shown that would mean approximately £30 million pounds lost from the housing sector based on a 3 per cent rise next year, with that money being instead retained by the UK Treasury. Um, Amendment 87 has um, is, is been lodged because I think it is absent from any, um, in section eight, any provision to consult relevant parties in the review process required to consider whether Part 1 remains necessary and proportionate. This amendment makes this requirement, which has been um, a, a serious criticism of the emergency legislation uh, process, a formal requirement. Uh, I hope that uh, formal consultation can, so, can go some way to resolving that issue and ask members to support um, Amendment 80 and 87. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 81 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Can I first of all um, put on record uh, our um, comments on Mark Griffin's Amendment Number 80? I think it makes some very valid points, reflecting the views that many of us have heard. I certainly wrote to all the housing associations in my region uh, about the very points that he's just made. Very valid points. We would support his amendment if were he to push it. I should add, um, and got a number of very detailed responses. And I think, for the benefit of time, I won't go into them in detail, but a number of them made that very point. Horizon Housing, for example, in my region, specifically said that the rent freeze will impact our future cash flow projections and reduce our ability to invest in our homes. That's something we've been talking about, but it, I've got it in black and white. Well, what does that mean, investing in homes? Not just new homes, but resulting in less kitchens, bathrooms, boilers, heat pumps, fabric, first works, etc., and they go on and on. And on uh, another group, uh, the Clock Housing Association, uh, said that this will have a negative impact in, to, on the services that they offer to their tenants um, and is a major concern to them. The Link Group, another housing association in my area, uh, say something similar. The Hanover Group, again, I've got reams and reams and reams of all this. So I think you know, I would really urge members to think carefully about voting against uh, Amendment 80 if it is pushed by the member. Um, my Amendment 81, though, uh, comes to the issue around extension. We have heard, of course, that this is emergency legislation with uh, a finite end life. Some do have concerns that the 18-month provision does stretch it a little bit too far. Uh, there's, there's nothing temporary about 18 months. It's a long time to put into place a policy like that. But I don't think, uh, well, very few people, I think, really believe that this is a temporary measure. I think there's a real fear, as is evident in the responses that we've had uh, from the market, uh, that this is something that will, uh, this mission creep will, will go on and on, because it's highly unlikely that the, the wider cost of living issues that have been discussed by, by members and by ministers uh, are, are going to clear up or go away anytime soon. So the fear is, therefore, that the, uh, there's a, a, there will be an inevitability that the government will come back and say, oh, we have to keep 
going with these measures. So what I'm asking for, and specifically in Amendment 81, is that when it comes to that crunch point in March 2023, uh, when ministers do come back to report and make a statement to Parliament, I mean, ideally, it should have been a, a new act, as members have indicated in other amendments, but if it's a continuation of the emergency legislation, um, then I have added some extra parameters of data, because I think data is what really should be driving this, specifically rent levels, the number of evictions that have taken place, the number of rental properties available on the housing market, and the level of rent arrears. And I, I, I believe that all of that data should be available to government. If it's not, I would be worried and concerned. Um, if it is available and it doesn't want to include it in the statement, I would equally be worried. If, of course, some of that data is just simply not available, that's fine too. It's a stage two amendment. I'm happy to work with ministers if he thinks that uh, some, that sounds a bit onerous. We can take some of it out. We can add to it if he thinks it's a helpful idea. So I'd be really interested in hearing uh, the government's views. And if they, if they are minded to push back on this amendment, I would ask why. Uh, amendments 88 and 89 do something slightly similar, but these are on uh, the wider reporting requirements uh, around uh, what the, the, this rent cap uh, uh, means. Again, asking for empirical data from them, specifically, specifically around average rent levels, the number of rental properties in the market and the level of rent arrears. But it goes on further this time, because what I'm asking ministers to identify is that if there is a notable decline in any of these metrics, and that's the key here, then Amendment 89 asks them to come back to Parliament and say what they're going to do to address this. Now, for example, if there is a notable reduce in the stock of housing available in the rental market as a byproduct of the legislation we pass, what is the government doing about it? If more people are being evicted for whatever reason, what is the government doing to address that? If rent arrears are markedly increasing, what is the government doing to address that as well? So I hope these are helpful amendments to the Parliament, because ultimately it will be, we, uh, it will be all of us who will have to give consent to the extension of that in March of next year. And I look forward to hearing the government's comments on these amendments. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 83 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I will speak to all amendments in this group in my name. This bill, is, this bill is firmly about helping to alleviate the cost of living crisis by freezing rents. And as outlined yesterday, I support that bill. But this crisis affects so many areas of our lives and so many people. In its midst, we need wide-ranging and bold action, action that delivers help to the people who need it for all the things that they need help with. And people need to know that we as legislators are listening and understand the scale of the problems they face today. As legislators, we must remain focused on the variety of measures that impact the cost of living crisis, and government must always be transparent about what they're doing to help. That's what I'm seeking to do with my amendments today. In Amendments 83 and 91, I'm asking the government to define the cost of living. Doing so is good legislative practice, and as I strongly support the principles of this bill, I want to do all I can to make it as robust as possible. If the government believe, as I do, that the cost of living crisis is strong enough to demand emergency legislation, I think it's only right that the Act should say what it means by the cost of living and list the various pressures on pockets this winter. Clear language makes for better legislation that more e is more easily implemented by the people responsible for making it work. And it makes it clearer to people in our regions that we understand the totality of their hardship. Because while this bill addresses a key factor by reducing the cost of living for people who rent, it will necessarily only reach one portion of the population, and it will only affect one of the many increasing bills people will face. That is why in Amendment 91 I have set out a list of areas that are affecting the cost of living. Presiding officer, crisis by their nature need fast action, and that needs transparent decision making. And so in Amendments 84 and 86, I'm seeking to improve transparency on decision making by asking the government to set out what they have taken, what action they have taken into account, what have they have taken into account, forgive me, in prioritising action on cost of living, which I support, and what other action they have taken and what and will take to alleviate that cost of living on the basis of the various factors set out in Amendment 91. This clarity, I think, is important because people need to be clear about what the government has done to help and why. And we've heard some claims that the government have spent £3 billion on this crisis, but we know from SPICE that only one-sixth of that is actually new funding. People in our regions do need to know what we're all doing to help them, and Parliament needs accurate and detailed information to be able to hold the government to account on actions. 
particularly when they are taken in the midst of a crisis and at pace. Amendment 91 will help this by ensuring the government set out clearly the actions they are taking through this crisis. Lastly, President Officer, Amendment 90 is a procedural one that clarifies the process for social landlords during the passage of the Bill. It creates an opportunity to allow the government to set out when it will let Parliament know whether the rent freeze and other provisions in the Bill are to be extended. I am moving this amendment on behalf of social housing providers who have been in contact with my party to outline how helpful it would be to know in January or February what the government intends to do on extending the provisions or not for the purposes of their planning procedures, for example, consulting with tenants over future rent levels. In the midst of a crisis, we need bold action and decisions that will help the most people. The government can only do that if they set out where action is needed and what action they have taken so that they can monitor it. And we on these benches can only help them if we can see what they have done and what they have still to do. That is what all the amendments lodged today in my name aim to address, and I hope the government will take them in that good faith and support them. President Officer, I urge members to back the amendments in my name, and I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. I call Paul Sweeney to speak to Amendment 85 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I stand to speak to Amendment No. 85 in my name following the Government's acceptance of my earlier Amendment No. 71 on provision of information and support for tenants. This second amendment would put a duty on Ministers to report on their progress with regards to keeping tenants informed of their rights, as outlined in my earlier amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 92 and other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. And I have been uh, taken by the fact that there have been amendments lodged in this group which all seek to achieve the same thing, which is to hold the Government to account as a result of this emergency legislation. We are all trying to work out what the effects will be and how those will affect not only landlords but also tenants and therefore housing in Scotland. I am taken by Mark Griffin's comments, Pam Duncan Glancy's comments. I can't agree with all your am amendments, but some of them, Jamie Green's and Paul Sweeney's, I, I like them because they are making the government answer the questions on the legislations they put forward. Therefore, my amendment, which is Amendment uh, 92, <coughs> is to further hold the government to account, and that is, uh, when it comes to uh, Section 8, is to ask after the expiry of Part 1 that Scottish ministers prepare a report on the cost and effect on landlords and tenants and the cost to the Scottish ministers including the loss of income from taxation which is not covered in the financial memorandum properly with this bill. Therefore, I think, presiding officer, that if the uh, four of us, five of us, got together and drafted an amendment to make a proper reporting procedure for this government there would be huge merit in doing that. But I, I do think that what the government is saying they want to do, which is uh, take a review of the operations of provisions with part one to review of considering whether they remain necessary and proportionate, is all they have to say is they are necessary and they are proportionate, and that is the end of their report. That, to me, uh, convener, is not sufficient. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Thanks, Convener. Um, before I come on to the amendments specifically, I just wanted to reiterate um, a point made by Patrick Harvey earlier on around the position of the social rented sector and to give assurance to some of the points that Mark Griffin and others raised. Um, we have made it very clear throughout yesterday and today that uh, the, the success and continued investment by, by, by the social rented sector is crucially important, crucially important to the delivery of the affordable housing supply programme. And that's why we have said and it's been received uh, well by the sector that we will work with them. We have the structure already set up through the, the task and, and finish group and we want to do that at pace and certainly before the review period in order to make a judgment going forward about what happens from the 1st of April uh, next year. And we want to do that in partnership with the sector. So it's not about us doing it to the sector. The agreement will be an agreement with the sector. Yes. Thank Thanks. the Cabinet Secretary. Does she recognise, though, that the sector now is rewriting its 10-year business plans and cancelling affordable home projects, which we all want to see built? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the sector is bringing forward affordable homes projects uh, as we speak, and they are and they are delivering affordable homes. I know this is something Miles Briggs doesn't like to hear, but they are af delivering affordable homes. The figures were just out yesterday that we've had uh, 113,000 uh, more affordable homes uh, delivered, 79,000 for social rent since uh, April 2007, way, way ahead of anything the UK government has delivered on affordable housing. Uh, what we need to do going forward, though, and the sector is wanting to do this, is to make sure that the agreement with the Scottish Government around what happens from April next year um, meets a number of criteria. One is that it continues to deliver affordable homes. One is that it is, um, ensures that tenants' rents are affordable going forward uh, and that we make sure that uh, the sector uh, can continue uh, to support tenants and tenants' welfare um, because we know that that's what they do well. So there are, we will get on with working with the sector to make sure all of that is delivered. Now, turning to the amendments specifically, Amendment 80 requires that the Scottish Government to include information uh, about funding. The statement will be much more comprehensive than that, and we will include all relevant information. And for that reason, the Amendment 80 is, is not required, and therefore... Uh, we do not uh, support it. Amendments 81, 88 and 89, um, we cannot support uh, these amendments for the, the following reasons. The statement of reasons required under section 6, 6 uh, when, Scottish um, with, when Scottish ministers wish to extend the expiry date of this bill and report uh, required under section 8, 1, setting out why Scottish ministers believe these measures remain necessary and proportionate in connection with the cost of living will be evidence-based. Just as we set out the evidence for this bill and the accompanying documents we have prepared and we would expect to be challenged if it were anything else. Amendments 81 and 88 are not necessary. Um, amendment 85, um, I am content to support Amendment 85 uh, in line with our acceptance of Amendment uh, 71. Uh, amendments 83, 84, 86, 90 and 91. Um, Convener Pam Duncan Glancy's amendments uh, create a, a very tight definition of cost of living, which would restrict the ability to include other key economic factors, such as levels of income, which all have a key impact on the cost of living. Some parts of the definition that is set out in this amendment are not directly relevant to the protection of tenants through a rent cap and eviction moratorium and are not within the scope of this legislation. The ordinary meaning of cost of living is appropriate and does not require an amendment to the legislation. And further, the amendment includes elements that are outside the scope of this Parliament's legislative competence, such as energy. So for those reasons, we, uh, we uh, urge members not to support uh, those amendments. Amendment 87, uh, convener will introduce a, a new requirement to consult before undertaking the reporting reviews we have already set out in the Bill. And given that we will consult with the persons and bodies set out by uh, Mr Griffin on an ongoing basis anyway, we are content to accept uh, this uh, amendment. Uh, amendment 92, we can't support. Ministers will, of course, consider the impacts of this Bill and, of course, this Parliament can uh, debate those. So, to summarise, and we've tried to accept where we can. Um, yes, Jamie Green. I appreciate the government secretary taking my intervention. I, I mean, summing up, uh, it sounds like the government is saying no to all of these amendments from a number of members from right across the chamber, which simply seek to enhance the levels of scrutiny uh, that the parliament can, can provide the extension of the measures. It, it seeks to expand the amount of data that is made available to us and that the government must gather and analyse, simply by saying that we will make a statement and it will all be fine and trust us on it. I, I, I fail to see any coherent rationale as to why the government is pushing back on all of these amendments. Surely there must be some give on this at stage two. Cabinet Secretary. The Tory bench, benches would listen to what is said. I have just said that I am accepting Amendment 85 um, from Paul Sweeney and Amendment 87 from Mark Griffin. So, you know, to say that we are not accepting amendments, if you actually just listen to what people say, you would actually perhaps not have to make interventions that are 
um, are, not, are a bit silly, to be honest. Anyway, um, I'm content to accept. Yes. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and, and forgive the length of time it's, got, it's taken me to, to get to the point. I was looking to see which number of amendment in, in the list. Um, amendment 86 asks, asks the government to set out any additional steps the Scottish ministers have taken to alleviate the cost of living. And whilst I recognise that defining something like the cost of living um, could be um, expansive, and I'd, I'd welcome um, a potential amendment at stage three if the government were willing to look at what that could look like. But if the government is not minded to define the cost of living, which I, I, I have to say I find odd in a bill that names the cost of living, would the government consider at least reporting as part of the mechanism within this bill so that we can understand across this chamber all of the measures the government has taken to alleviate the cost of living during the period that the rent freeze is in place, not just so we can help scrutinise the legislation, but also so that other people outside this chamber can understand that, we un that the government appreciates the totality of their hardship. Cabinet Secretary. Okay. Well, first of all, I mean, on the, the general definition of cost of living, it covers the general cost of goods and services viewed as necessary to maintain an average or minimum standard of living. That is a common understanding of cost of living. The point Pam Duncan Glancy makes about what action this government is taking on cost of living, I mean, we've set out already now we can debate the point she made about the three billion pounds. The point I've made to Pam Duncan Glancy previously is that something doesn't have to have been announced uh, last month in order to be impacting positively on the cost of living of household incomes. If someone requires a prescription next week, it's a prescription they're not going to have to pay for, whereas they would be paying £9.25, I think, per item if they were based in England. And of course, that helps with household incomes. So we have to look at the package of cost of living support in the round, and we'll continue to, to do that very briefly. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for this and to other members of the Chamber because I appreciate it's late. The, the point I'm making about the £3 billion is not, com not asking to compare what the Scottish Government is spending um, in, in Scotland in terms of prescriptions in comparison to what's happening in England. I'm asking for the Scottish Government to set out what it is doing now that the cost of living crisis is biting, that is specifically about getting us through this cost of living, rather than package all the measures together that we expect in Scotland, and some of which were put, under, were put in motion by a Labour Government in Scotland. The point Cabinet is it doesn't secretary. matter when they were put in place, they are impacting positively on household yeah. incomes to help people with the cost of living. You can't, it, would, it, would, it would be ridiculous to only count things that were announced in the last year that impact the, the cost of living. That would exclude so many important elements that actually help with family budgets. Now, of course, we always want to look at what more we can do. We've made a commitment to look at, through the emergency budget review to look at what more we can do, but it can't always be about what is just newly announced. It has to be looked in the round of everything that is being done. And £1 billion of that £3 billion of support is only available in Scotland. So that is resources that this government is put in place no way, not available anywhere else. So, of course, that has to be counted. But look, coming back to, to, to the points here in terms of the amendments, we have tried in this set of amendments to uh, support those amendments that we think will help um, to, to get to the point of, uh, of the nub of what uh, members are looking for here, which is why uh, we are content to accept Amendment 85 from Paul Sweeney and Amendment 87 from Mark Griffin, but we can't accept the remainder of the amendments in this grouping and urge the members uh, not to press them. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 80. Yeah. Thanks, Camina. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments and support for Amendments 85 uh, and 87 in this group. I, I do have a um, degree of sympathy for Amendment um, 81 in the name of uh, Jimmy Green in the sense that it gets to the heart of the issue that has essentially plagued the housing market, market for longer than we've been here in that there is a, a lack of data on rents, there is a lack of data on um, rent increases within tenancies, there is just a dearth of data within that sector for us to come to a reasoned assessment of whether a policy position is right or wrong uh, and I appreciate the the motivation behind that amendment. Um, on Amendment 80, I think it's fair to say that the, the subject of the, the impact of a cap 
on the finances of um, housing associations has been one of the, the, the key points raised in the debate, not by me, not just by me, but right across the chamber. And an amendment looking specifically to assess the financial impact on um, housing associations and particularly their funding for the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, I think, would be key. It's an example of um, government taking good action, which, which we support in the, the short term to get us through the cost of living crisis, being at odds with our long-term ambition to boost the, the number of affordable houses that are built. Now, I, I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said about the work that was ongoing, and I welcome that. I also heard what the Cabinet Secretary said about the, the measures that I am suggesting being included in a comprehensive review that would be carried out anyway. And so I just gently say, if it's going to be carried out anyway and included within that review, then there would be no harm in supporting it and giving that assurance across the Chamber that it will be the, the financial viability of registered social landlords will be seriously taken account of, not just in here, but give comfort to the sector as well, and press Amendment 80. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The committee is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 80 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes 50, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 81 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 80. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The committee is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Sharon Dowie. I would have voted yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Thank you. 
The result of the vote on amendment number 81 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 48, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 82 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 74. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not to move, Camina. Thank you. Okay. The question is that section 6 and section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 83 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 80. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? No. The question is that amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 83 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 21, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 84 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 80. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? I moved. The question is that amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed. Therefore, we'll move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Finlay Carson. Uh, I was unable to connect to the voting system. I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Stephanie Callahan. I don't think my vote's gone through. I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 84 
in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 20, no 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 85 in the name of Paul Sweeney, already debated with amendment 80. Paul Sweeney to move or not move? Move, presiding officer. The question is that amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 86 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 80. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Move. No. The question is that amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed, therefore we'll move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 86 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 21, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 87 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 80. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 88 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 80. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 89 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 80. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 80. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <laughs> the committee is not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 90 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 50, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 91 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 80. Oh, my apologies, let's just rewind very slightly. Um, I, the question is that section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are. I now call Amendment 91 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 80. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 92 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 80. Edward Mountain, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed. We will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 92 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 28, no 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to the group entitled Ensuring Resources for Tribunals, and I call Amendment 93 in the name of Miles Briggs uh, in a group on its own. Miles th Briggs to move and speak to Amendment 93. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Uh, my Amendment uh, 93 looks towards providing additional resources uh, for tribunals. Uh, we are concerned around the impact this bill will have and the impact being uh, potentially significant. Um, we already know that tribunals face an eight to nine month waiting time and backlog of work. Um, so what we're doing today is calling on ministers to provide uh, resources, uh, to financial resources and assistance to our tribunals, including grants, loans, guarantees, and, amend and indemnities over and above the current financial year, year settlement should tier, first tier tribunals or tribunals see a significant increase in the numbers of cases coming forward. I hope ministers will look at this as an important part of making sure that the system will work uh, for any landlords and tenants as well. Yeah, Thank you, Mr Briggs. Uh, I note that Edward Mountain would wish to intervene. Mr Mountain. Thank you, Deputy Convener. I just try to speak on this point because I think it is seriously important that first tribunals are up and first tier tribunals are up and working properly because it will prevent problems getting worse. Now, my colleague Miles Briggs has mentioned about getting correct resources there. I think it would also be extremely helpful and I think the government should look at reporting on the efficiency of first tier tribunals. I have asked questions on this in the Parliament before and they have not been able to tell me how long the wait, waiting list is on first tribunals. I am told today in Glasgow, as I have said earlier, it is between six and nine months. That frankly is not good enough and uh, I, I do believe that the government should be conceding to Mr Briggs's request here. Thank you Mr Mountain. I call the Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, as Miles Briggs sets out, Amendment 93 uh, places a requirement for ministers to ensure adequate resources uh, are available for the first tier tribunal uh, should the provisions in Part 1 result in a significant increase to the number of cases being heard. I do not believe this amendment is necessary. Where a change is made to a case type in the Housing and Property Chamber of the first tier tribunal, the Scottish Government fully funds the cost by in-year transfer based on a spending forecast agreed between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Once caseload has reached a settled state, a baseline transfer of costs is agreed. This is a standard approach across all first-tier tribunal chambers. Uh, private rented sector case costs have not yet been baselined. 
We expect to meet the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service shortly to agree a transfer of costs for the remainder of this financial year, including those as a result of the legislation via the spring budget revision. Uh, that process is uh, adequate to meet the, the needs of the Tribunal, uh, and I do not believe this amendment is necessary. I urge Mr Briggs not to press it. Uh, I call Miles Briggs to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 93. Thank you, Convener. I hear what the Minister says. Um, given that the Government are now proposing a review before March 31st, um, at March 31st date, I am um, not sure he necessarily said whether or not the, the potential additional work the tribunals will face if this is extended beyond March 31st and how that will then be uh, financially supported. Um, would that be on a six-month review or for the next financial year the government give resources from April? Happy Minister. So, I am grateful to the member giving way. What I have attempted to do is give a description of how it is the Scottish Government and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, reach agreement about the funding uh, of these uh, processes uh, every year. That process will be unchanged. No, I fully understand that. I think my concern is, given the additional work which tribunals could face, and given the fact that they already have an eight to nine month waiting time and backlog, um, this is not going to help the system if they're financially not in a good place. So I tend to um, press the, the amendment and hope ministers will take on board the need to make sure that this the tribunal system has to work or the system will just collapse. Uh, I note Mr Briggs is intending to press the amendment. The question therefore is that amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed there will be a division. Members should vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote in amendment number 93 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 50, no, 65. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that section 9 is agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I now move to the next grouping, open market rent. I call Amendment 94 in the name of Edward Mountain, grouped with Amendments 95, 97, 98 and 100. I call on Edward Mountain to move Amendment 94 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I do move Amendment 94. The point of these amendments are that at the conclusion of this emergency legislation, that the, rent, uh, the first tier tribunals take into account the market value of rents. Now, that is the whole point of the legislation in the 84, 88 and 16 Act, to allow the market to set the rent. Now, a lot of people would say that rents have got inflated in some areas. I have to say that is not my experience of 35 years in the market of working in the Highlands where it has certainly been a definition of an open market rent would be the best value achieved with a willing landlord and a willing tenant. Both sides have to be willing to enter into the agreement. My fear, uh, convener, is that by the government not including this and by saying that they will determine what matters need to be taken into account, they will be distorting the market, which will then cause houses to be taken out of the rental sector, which has been alluded to by my colleagues in, in earlier conversations. 
I mean, if you cannot get a rent that covers the costs for a property on a long-term let, which in, I have to say in my case is what I try and achieve because I think there's values in long-term lets, then you have to look at other vehicles such as short-term lets and Airbnb. Frankly, I don't think that's going to help people live in communities. And I know uh, the Minister has views on that, some of which I support. So I am asking that the government consider including the, value, the word open market rent when this emergency has passed, which at the moment they have specifically excluded. Thank you, Deputy Convener. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call the Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to the member for uh, being clear about his intentions behind this. I, uh, I have to say there are some uh, uh, issues he raises which do relate to the longer term arguments about the future uh, of the, the rental sector. Uh, I would have to say that I, from my experience as a regional MSP for Glasgow, uh, I would say that there are a great many people who would disagree with him uh, that the, uh, the, the market uh, is not leading to inflated rents. And indeed, uh, I have many constituents who are paying more for a rental property than they would for even a repayment mortgage on the same property, even though they, uh, it, the, the, the rights and security of tenure and so on that they have uh, as a tenant are less than a homeowner has. So I, I think there, there is a long-term argument uh, very clearly about whether uh, the, the open market rent approach uh, is one uh, that secures what the Scottish Government wants to secure, which is that human right for adequate housing to be met for everyone. But as I say, some of this is a longer term discussion and will be taken forward through uh, the work that we're doing under the New Deal for Tenants and permanent legislation in the, in the future. As for this emergency legislation, it is very clear that if and when circumstances change and we reach the view that the emergency measures are no longer proportionate and no longer justified by circumstance and necessity, uh, we will have to move away from them. It is essential that we have a bridge uh, away from that process rather than just a direct return to open market rents. All of the amendments in this group would essentially remove the ability to modify the rent adjudication process uh, so as to prevent a, a cliff edge. Uh, and if we took that approach there is a genuine possibility uh, that the ending of the emergency measures uh, would lead to a, a, a frankly unsustainable position for a great many people right around the country, not just in, in areas like Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, but including in areas that the member represents. Uh, it's not enough, in my view, to say that a, a tenancy that's agreed at whatever rent is, is agreed freely between the landlord and the tenant, because a great many people in our society are unable to afford owner occupation because of the inflated house prices that we see. Uh, and the reason why the Scottish Government is so determined to press ahead with the increase in provision of social housing is that a great many people have found that unavailable. And so the private rented sector, for far too many people, is their only choice. They have no freedom to make a different choice. They have only the option of accepting what the private uh, rented housing market offers them. Uh, and for many people, that is good quality housing at an affordable price. But for far too many others, uh, it is housing that is of poorer energy performance standards than the rest of the housing stock and is unaffordable. Uh, the emergency measures that we're taking are about these current circumstances, but it is absolutely essential that we retain the power to modify the rent adjudication process again on a temporary basis as a bridge out of the emergency measure. So I strongly urge Parliament to reject all, the, all of the amendments in this group. Thank you, Minister. I call on Edward Mountain to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 94. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner, and I'll keep this short. I mean, what, I, what I'm feared is that we are using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, and we are making huge decisions on generalised comments in relation to some parts of Scotland to other parts of Scotland. I think that's why we need to consider what the open market rent would be. I don't think my amendments suggest that, suggest that it has to go to an open market rent. I'm just saying that they should be considered. And the danger, of course, Minister, as you well know, is that if we don't give some stability to the housing market and the private rental market, we will see the lack of investment in that market. And there is a, certainly a very large builder 
uh, who is located close to Elgin, who has already put on hold development because of the legislation that's going on in this parliament today. So, presiding officer, I will press my amendment and uh, I conclude that. Thank you, Mr Mountain. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote in Amendment Number 94 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 28, no, 86. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 95 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 94. I call on Edward Mountain to move or not move. Uh, Deputy Convener, on the basis that all of these amendments are linked to one specific point, I don't intend to press any of them, so I will not move Amendment 95. Thank you, Mr Mountain. Um, I call Amendment 96 in the name of... Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I have uh, I've gone ahead of myself. Um, I would now turn to the next grouping, which is additional scrutiny of draft regulations. I call Amendment 96 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with Amendment 99. I call on Miles Briggs to move Amendment 96 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Briggs. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. And before we reach Mr Cole Hamilton's crowning gr glory today, I wanted to bring forward an attempt to get some additional um, opportunity for Parliament to look at the unintended consequences of uh, this legislation, because G Jamie Green's Amendment 81 was incredibly important to provide real-world data on the impact this will have. We know the sector is talking about unintended consequences of this bill. We want the Scottish Government to look towards providing uh, this information as soon as possible as well. That's why, therefore why my amendment looks towards um, this being provided before the end of this year. So we can look at the actual impact and the data which decisions will be taken under by Ministers, including around the extension of this legislation, or to increase the cap um, further uh, than the current uh, March 31st date and also when the, these emergency powers will finally end. Now, we believe that a draft of the plans ministers will develop around this should be published before the end of the year and are asking that to take place so that Parliament can properly scrutinise future plans, what data will be used by ministers to take decisions to then increase people's rent in the coming uh, parts of this bill. So I hope members will look towards how that will provide far more scrutiny around this regulations for Parliament. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I now call the Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the um, effect of these amendments is to require uh, a, a draft of the proposed regulations uh, three months before the expiry of the bill, uh, and uh, regulations made under the current Schedule 3 are subject to the affirmative procedure. That means they will be subject to 54 days of parliamentary scrutiny before they are made. Given that the provisions of Schedule 3 will apply in anticipation of the expiry of the emergency measures, it is envisaged that any regulations made under Schedule 3 would be introduced 54 days before the expiry of those measures. 
Therefore, this amendment is unnecessary. And in addition, it may not be possible to fulfil the requirements of this amendment because we do not know when the emergency measures will expire. I am sure that the Conservative uh, members uh, will be keener than anyone if circumstances change and the government is no longer able to demonstrate the ongoing necessity and proportionality of these measures, they will want us to expire them uh, as soon as that becomes possible. And so it would not be appropriate to place this additional requirement uh, for advanced publication of a draft, uh, given that it may not be possible to do that in time for expiry in those circumstances. So I do not believe this would be workable, uh, and I would uh, urge uh, the member not to press this amendment. Uh, I, I would want to stress that we are keen to make sure that the decisions and policy development around uh, these regulations is transparent. And I can commit to uh, publishing a, a draft for consultation and working with Parliament and stakeholders on their development uh, and uh, ensuring that, that opportunity is as uh, significant as possible. I can't support the specific uh, measures in uh, this amendment. I call on Miles Briggs to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 96. Uh, thank you, Convener. I have heard what the Minister has to say, and certainly from the work of the Local Government and Housing Committee, we are concerned at the total lack of data um, around this and, and the real need for us to develop that. I have heard what the Minister has said um, and happy to withdraw these amendments, but I hope the Minister has understood the views across Parliament that we need to see how this uh, future decision around this will actually be um, taken with real-world data and the unintended consequences which potentially uh, this is going to have, because I think it is very important that uh, Parliament is not taking future decisions uh, without that data um, across parties being provided. Uh, Miles Briggs seeks to withdraw Amendment Number 96. Does any member object? No member objects. Amendment 96 is withdrawn. I now call Amendment 97. In the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 94. Edward Mountain, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I now call Amendment 98. In the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 94. Edward Mountain, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I now call Amendment 99. Uh, in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 96. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I now call Amendment 100 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 94. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Not moved, Deputy not moved. Convener. Uh, the question is that Schedule 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I now move to the last grouping, which is Crown Consent, and I call Amendment 101 in the name of Alex Go Hamilton in a group on its own. I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to move and speak to Amendment 101. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Convener. Members will be pleased to hear. I've been slashing through my remarks, taking paragraphs out left, right, and centre. <laughs> <laughs> what you have to do, what you have to do to get a clap in this place, I don't know. Um, Deputy Convener, uh, this this bill, Deputy Convener, this bill represents the first for this Parliament, uh, but also for our new King. It will be the first. A uh, whole piece of legislation to trans through the transit through the Scottish Parliament to which his signature will be affixed. Last year, The Guardian, in collaboration with the Scottish Liberal Democrats, uncovered that the monarch's lawyers um, had vetted at least 67 pieces of legislation that affected Crown property and powers. Before the summer, a Scottish Government memo indicated that it was, like, quote, almost certain draft laws were quietly changed to address Crown concerns and to secure its approval. We don't know what changes were made or even which bills were amended. Now, looking to the future, this is the first bill which requires Crown consent under King Charles III. This is the first time the new procedures introduced by the presiding officer and Scottish Ministers of Peace will have been applied to a bill. As a result of those changes, it will be confirmed that Crown consent has been sought and agreed. That is expected at stage three, where I presume ministers will simply confirm as much in a single sentence. However, I believe that Parliament also deserves to know what specific changes, if any, have or will be made to this legislation at the request of the Crown's lawyers. My amendment would require Scottish ministers to prepare a report doing three things, or covering three things, a summary of any discussions, details of any changes requested, and the government's response to those requests. The period of three months allows the Parliament to reflect on the content of this report prior to any potential extension of powers in March 2023. Um, the language also, you'll notice, 
My amendment reflects that contained in Rule 9.11 of Standing Orders. I think, De Deputy Convener, that people deserve to know if changes to law are being discussed or agreed. I want to end by wishing the new King well. Um, he carries with him the goodwill of the country and our party. And with that, too, the goodwill and the, the expectations of his own stated hope for modernisation and transparency in this amendment, we will help him to do exactly that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cole Hamilton. I now would ask Minister George Adam to respond. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, it's been a long afternoon and longer evening. I'm going to try to be brief and at the same time try and uh, make sure that Mr Cole Hamilton's concerns are addressed. I fear I may fail in both right enough, but I'm going to try. So, as all members are aware, uh, the Scotland Act 1998, the UK Act which provides for the current devolution <coughs> settlement, has required the Scottish Parliament and Government since 1999 to seek Crown consent if the same bill would need such consent were it passed in the UK Parliament. As required by the Scotland Act, the Scottish Parliament's standing orders set out the rules for determining this for each bill. Crown consent is required where a Scottish bill impacts the private property or interests of the sovereign. Where that requirement is identified, the Scottish Government is required to obtain that consent. This is not a choice being taken by the Scottish Government. As this bill contains provisions affecting private residential tenancies, which could affect residential tenancies on His Majesty's private estates and those on land forming part of the Scottish Crown estate, Crown consent is required. In order for the necessary consent to be provided, a copy of the bill has been shared with the Palace. As required by standing orders, the King's consent to this bill is expected to be signified to Parliament ahead of bill uh, being debated at stage three. This process has not changed and is the process which has been followed by each Scottish Government since 1999, including previous Labour Liberal Democrat governments. However, to make matters more transparent, presiding officer, uh, Parliament was made aware on Monday that the Scottish Government will from now on make clear in, a bill, in Bill's accompanying documents how provisions in the Bill apply to the Crown and why the Crown consent is required. We are the first Scottish Government to make this additional information available to Parliament on a Bill's introduction. This will ensure that MSPs have full information on the introduction of a Bill to enable them to scrutinise and debate this throughout the passage of the Bill. It, was, it has always been open to MSPs and committees to raise questions as to whether why the Crown consent is required during any of the Bill's parliamentary passages. Uh, this has not changed. Members will also be aware that it remains Scottish Government policy that legislation should apply to the Crown in the same way as it does to any other person. Yeah. I would like to confirm that this Bill applies to the Crown in the same way as it applies to anyone else. This amendment seeks to require the Government to report on various discussions that have been held and discussion, uh, discussions that have been taken after the Bill has passed. I would like to make clear that Bills before they have, are published may change for all sorts of reasons based on different discussions with stakeholders. It is difficult to see the purpose as served by requiring the Government to provide a report on these matters in relation to the King after the Bill has passed. The question, presiding officer, for the Parliament on this bill and in future bills is whether or not it is content with the way in which a bill applies to the Crown. In this case, whether the Parliament is content that the bill applies to the Crown in the same way as anyone else. For these reasons, presiding officer, I cannot support Amendment 101 and I would urge the member not to press to a vote. Thank you, Minister. I now call Alex Go Hamilton to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 101. Um, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Convener. I, I listened to the Minister's remarks. Um, I, I wasn't making a partisan point. I, I think he thought I was. This is about scrutiny and transparency. It's not about who is in charge at, at any period in history. Um, transparency and scrutiny are pillars of our democracy. They have indeed been championed by our new King. And Parliament has the opportunity tonight to agree upon a principle. Um, I believe basically, in simple terms, Deputy Convener, that people have a right to know when changes are made to the laws of our land or agreements struck, and um, particularly when those have happened because of discussions between ministers and the Crown. I believe that should apply whether changes are made before a bill, a bill arrives in Parliament, while it is passing through our committees and chamber, or when adjustments are made in the years to come through secondary legislation. With this amendment and with, it, this, and with this bill, uh, which marks the first in a number of respects, the Scottish government, government could agree to produce this simple report and with it a signal, the signal that it, it supports the principle that both Parliament and the public deserve to, deserve to know how their laws are made and who is influencing them. I move the amendment in my name and I wish to press. 
Thank you, Mr. Cohamilton. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 101 in the name of Alex Go Hamilton is yes, 22, no, 93. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that sections 11 to 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That ends stage two consideration, and I would notify members that the amendment deadline for stage three will be 9 a.m. tomorrow, Thursday, 6 October. Given that the stage two consideration of the coronavirus of the, the bill has now concluded, and that one concluded some time ago, uh, this meeting of the whole committee of the Parliament uh, uh, is now concluded, and I close that meeting. And there will now be a short suspension before we move on to the outstanding items to be dealt with tonight. <laughs>